minutes at the microphone. There'll be the timer on the clock that we'll ask you to keep an eye on. The timer will begin when you state your name for the record. And I'll just ask audience members to refrain uh, from any kind of uh, comment or participation in any way during that time. I will begin public comment um, by calling Stephen E. Honeycutt to the podium. And again, um, you will state your name for the record and your timer will begin. Followed by Mr. Honeycutt will be Chaz uh, Dutois, I believe it is, but you can correct my pronunciation when you state your name at the podium. Good morning, Mr. Honeycutt. You may begin. Thank you. Stephen E. Honeycutt. Yes, it's me again, the one who sent so many emails. It would have been easier to read War and Peace. There is a light at the end of the tunnel, and you must all be relieved. No more emails. I'm relieved also, running out of ways to have a new stadium. I have been asked, why so passionate about this stadium? How do I answer that? I enjoy taking pictures. I was able to take pictures at the M's games for a couple of years. One day, the Red Strugger guard photographer and I were sharing pictures, and he said, I see what most people don't see. One part of my passion is just that. I see what most people don't see. I see little children spellbound watching a game that people say is like watching paint dry. There is a lot of us paint dryer watchers. Add beer, your family, you can't beat it. I recall an older couple, he listening to the game on the radio, she keeping the box scores. What was it like many years ago and what is keeping them coming back? They're gone now, but I look at the seats they sat in, I can still see them sitting there. Baseball is a chess game. Watch it, you see what I'm talking about. When Major League created this mess, when the M's realized this could help the community and not just think about themselves, it was time to get behind them. My passion is not just about saving the M's, it's about saving this community from losing a very important part. They are involved in this community. Besides seeing what others don't see, it's the community what drives me to send so many emails, what prompt me to speak before the city and you folks. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. I ne neglected to mention as well as um, as you go ahead and come to the podium. If you did bring any kind of materials or anything else that you want the board to have, please leave them at the staff table with our administrator. Thank you. Uh, you may begin your public comment. State your name for the record. My name is Chaz Dutois. You got it perfectly right. Thank you so much. I want to start by just thanking uh, you know your public service to Lane County. I have a really high regard for the work that you do, and I'm, I, um, I want to thank you for that and thank the county administrator. You have hard jobs and hard decisions to make. Um, to me, this is an easy decision. It's about quality of life for Eugene. Uh, I've only been here since 1976. I'm kind of a newcomer. I'm, I'm getting used to the place. Uh, but every summer uh, has included Eugene M's games for me. Uh, and the kind of quality of life that families and people have by having this uh, organization be a part of us. And I really want to say that uh, Alan Benavides has done a fabulous job as manager and really upping the game in terms of the M's involvement in the community and what that organization does for us. So I'm highly supportive of this uh, stadium. I'm highly supportive of I'm upping my property taxes a little bit to make it happen. And I hope that the county can support this endeavor. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next up is Jill Cole, followed by Heidi Ringus. Good morning. My name is Jill Cole. I'm a fourth generation Lane County resident. I am here in support of the multi-use stadium at the fairgrounds. We have a chance for a much needed beautification project here in Eugene. There's millions of dollars on the table and I just don't want to see it go away. It's not just about a baseball team. It's about a beautiful new building that will help modernize our aging fairgrounds. This is facility would inspire our youth to be outside. I've worked in youth ministry and been a volunteer with 4J schools for over a decade now. And this is something that is an investment to get our youth and our kids off their screens. It's an investment in family time. It's a potential venue to celebrate our high school graduates, even sports competitions and heck, marching bands. I'm tired of taking my kids out of town for marching band competitions when this could totally be a place. I really uh, appreciate Alan Benavides. He's totally willing to be working with everybody involved to make sure that it's a good fit. Um, this organization actively gives back to our community, to schools, to kids' sports programs, to supporting our loved ones and neighbors that are battling cancer celebrates diversity. It even shines a light on Florence by adopting that alternative identity, the exploding whales. 
When the hats dropped last March, I don't know if you all know that, but it sold out in about three minutes, and the hats were shipped out internationally. Baseball fans and ball collectors all now know about the exploding whales in Florence, Oregon. It's now a bucket list to visit the exploding whale park there. This organization shatters glass ceilings. They have the first ever all-female press box. I even chatted with a writer and director in Hollywood last year that was inspired by my story of going from heckler to a PA announcer for the Eugene M's. I just hope that the movie ends not with the black screen and the white letters saying, oh, I lost my job, <laughs> and we don't even have the Eugene Emeralds or Exploding Whales playing anymore. But I do hope that it's a drone shot coming out of that multi-use stadium in Eugene here. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your public comment. Next up is Heidi Ringus, and she'll be followed by <coughs> Debbie, Debbie Peterson. Hi, my name's Heidi Ringus. Um, so, I hope you all had a chance to read what I gave you last week. And I would like to let you know where I got that. I got that information from LMD's own exhibit that they entered into the hearing, for, and which also includes several bits of information that we were denied when we put in our application for the information pertaining to John, John's um, file. Um, there are several other things. Of, of one important thing is John got these CAs to remove all the RVs off of his property. He's done that. They have not closed out the CAs. So, and the other thing is, we have asked you several times um, for an audience before the board. We have put it in writing. We have verbally asked here on the record, we need a date because I'm, what we gave you last week, you need to look into that. And I would like to know who the performance auditor is for the specific thing. If not, I would like to be the performance auditor because I've done enough research <laughs> to know what's going on. So we would like a date today of when we can be before the board. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next up is Debbie Peterson, and she'll be followed by Ed Wilson. Thank you. Um, thank you and good morning. My name is Debbie Peterson. I'm here this morning to make you aware of a sport that is currently being played at the Lane Events Center. We have 10 three-day dog agility events and two AKC obedience and rally competitions. These trials bring in people from California, Arizona, Nevada, Idaho, Washington State, as well as Alaska and Hawaii. They fly in here to attend these events. They stay in our hotels, they eat in our restaurants, they shop in our stores. The, it is my understanding from a uh, study at the universe, uh, university sports management program that minor league baseball does bring in local people, but it does not bring in a great amount of tourists. They don't stay and do the things that our people do. AKC Sport of Dog Agility is one of the fastest growing sports you may see them on ESPN being run. Our events are organized by a single Oregon woman who has built her business from the ground up with no taxpayer help. If, these, if the um, stadium is built, it will remove our event center and will also take all of her employees and give them no jobs. It is 50% of her income. Do you wish to be a part of that? Consider also that the Lane County Fair is a tradition that's been going on since 1884. There will be no room for that. There is no contingency for that. Do you want to be part of that? Do you want to be the ones who stop that event? Don't get me wrong. I like baseball. My husband attends some of the games. I am not opposed to a stadium. I am opposed to it being paid for by the taxpayers. I am opposed to it being put in the middle of a heavy residential area. We sometimes get calls from people for one barking dog. Come on, people. There is no sound that is anything like a baseball game. I've been there. Those people are going to be crazy mad. I, am, I ask you that, you that you agree to have a stadium. It's fine with me. But may a multimillionaire corporation pay for their own stadium. Don't raise our taxes. Thank you for your comment. Uh, next up is Ed Wilson, and he'll be followed by Dave Backey. 
My name is Ed Wilson. I appreciate the opportunity to speak in favor of the stadium this morning. The, uh, the ballpark is a good investment. It's a good investment in the community and uh, the fairgrounds. The, the uh, Emeralds have been around for, for 75, over 75 years. The, uh, this investment will pay dividends over the next 75 years. The, um, I hear often when I'm, when I'm speaking to people about the stadium, as I have a lot lately, I hear often that, oh, you know, my granddad used to bring me, my mom used to bring me to the gut ball games. We've been going to ball games since, since the 70s, and, um, and we see that. We're in the stands every night. We see the, uh, the kids they are brought with their parents and their grandparents, and uh, I would hope that we get to keep doing that. Thanks. Thank you for your public comment. Next up is Dave Backey, followed by Patty Norber. Yeah, uh, good, good morning. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Dave Bakke. I'm uh, president of Chambers Construction, but I want you to know I'm not here on a on that level. I'm here as a citizen of Eugene. Uh, I live in the area of the stadium. Uh, I support the project and and. I don't support it just because it's baseball. I support it because the CB Gene and Lane County are in a desperate need for a facility that provides family activities. If we lose the M's, the M's then I don't know that you can actually name a, a place where families can go with, with their kids and experience any sort of an event uh, that, that benefits the, the entire family. It doesn't matter how old you are. Uh, and also, I think the the fairgrounds is is a an opportunity for not just a multi use facility for baseball and and a, and concerts and other things, but you you have an opportunity to to make South Willamette Valley a destination for sporting and other activities. You could do the multi use baseball facility and a multi use indoor sports facility at the same time or maybe spread out a couple of years and, and make the South Willamette Valley a destination for hundreds and hundreds of different sports teams and activities. And you could, you could use an indoor sports facility for the AKC. You could use it for lots of different things. It doesn't have to just be sports. And to, to have a 50 acre piece of property in the heart of downtown, the heart of downtown that is struggling mightily to have an identity that want that people want to come to. This is a this is an opportunity that I, th I think you you just can't pass up on. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next up is Patty Norberg, followed by Gordon Culbertson. Good morning. I'm Patty Norberg. Thank you for your time today. I've been a lifelong baseball fan since growing up in Illinois and following the Chicago Cubs. And I moved to Eugene in 1986, and I've been going to M's games since they first played at Civic and now at PK Park. Some games I ride my scooter to, and I enjoy watching the young players in the A and the long A seasons play ball with such passion and hopes to make it to the majors. There are two guys right now, Ian Happ and Miguel Amaya, Amaya, who are starters on the Cubbies, and I watch them play as Eugene Emeralds. That's really exciting. I live two blocks from the fairgrounds, so it's in my backyard, and I would love to walk to games at the new stadium. I also go to a lot of concerts and would love to walk to enjoy live music and other activities. I've paid taxes in Eugene since 1986. I don't have kids, but I pay taxes for schools and education. I don't ride the bus, I pay taxes for our buses. I do love baseball, and I would gladly pay an extra $25 per year in my property taxes to enjoy baseball and any other entertainment and activities in my own backyard. Having a stadium in my backyard would be like getting birthday and Christmas presents for the rest of my life. Please say yes to build this field of dreams. I thank you for your time today. Thank you for your public comment. Next up is Gordon Culbertson, followed by Diane Luis. Good day, commissioners. Thank you for taking my testimony today. My name is Gordon Culbertson. 
As a lifetime resident, I'm very concerned about the future well-being of cultural, educational, and recreational events held at the fairgrounds. The Emerald's proposal glosses over these implications. We could move the stadium east a little bit, or we really don't know where the money will come from. This shows we are shoehorning a big stadium into a place that it doesn't fit. The M's proposal will require a fine livestock arena to be demolished. The venue is home to the 4-H Fair, an annual exhibition of animals during the Lane County Fair. One of the pillars of our fair is to celebrate our agricultural history. I hope you commissioners won't be put in the position to look at the 4-H kids and the FFA kids, look them in the eye and say you've been kicked to the curb. Each February, the Oregon Logging Conference is held for four days at the fairgrounds. The OLC is one of the largest conventions in Lane County. During the slack tourism season, this convention brings in $7 million to local businesses. The proposed stadium will encroach on their footprint by 30% and make the logistics much more difficult. We're a baseball family. When our son-in-law was drafted by the Giants, he first played in the Northwest League. Major League Baseball places difficult, arbitrary, and really in a lot of cases untenable requirements on farm clubs like the M's. However, the M's fairgrounds proposal is vague in addressing issues of financial and lost opportunity cost by forcing a stadium at the expense of the community without a defined return. Let's not be stampeded into a false choice of Eugene baseball or a fairgrounds for all of Lane's residents. Love for the M's aside, this is a wish and hope proposal. Reality is the fairgrounds is the wrong place for the stadium. I urge you to vote no. This is a costly mistake. Please reject this once and for all. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next up is Diane Louise, followed by George Hermach. And again, please correct pronunciation of your name. If I got it wrong, I apologize. Good morning. And my name is Diane Louise. I am a resident of Eugene for near 25 years. I have some real issues with building this fair stadium, which was a baseball stadium, and then it became a multi-use stadium, and then it's emergency this, and then we're going to have shops, and we're going to have a hotel, and phase one, phase two, phase three. Where does it end? We have not been transparent with our taxpayers of what phase two, what phase three looks like. Do we have a traffic plan? Do we have a noise abatement plan? Do we have the money to pay EPD to n navigate traffic for 170 games a year? That's ridiculous. We need our cops and our police out on the street, not directing traffic. It makes absolutely no sense to me. Uh, it feels like smoke and mirrors because six, eight months ago, we were talking about a baseball stadium. Now we keep adding more and more to make it, make it look better. It's not any better. We talk about a lot of personal things here of like, oh, my husband proposed to me at the M's game. I love the M's. We talk about family friendly. Well, when the costs continue to ex escalate, it's not going to be family friendly, right? Adding $25 to my property tax is horrible. I am at a point right now where I am property taxed out. I have a choice where I can make my mortgage payment, which has stayed the same, or I can continue to add, we can continue to add bond measures and bond measures to a point where it's, property tax is unaffordable. That is what's going to cost me to leave after 25 years. I've paid $100,000 in property tax. Where is it going? It should not go to a private public quasi joint venture. And I don't know that we can afford to pay in arrears the TTL. Why are we doing that? Every concert, every venue, everything you're talking about, there's got to be a disclaimer that says, oh, by the way, your tax, a tax for your rental car or a tax for your hotel, that's going directly to the M's. What, why would a kennel club want to support the M's? Anyway, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Uh, I have Thank lots you. more to say, and I'll continue to write in until this is dissolved. Thank you for your public comment. You're welcome. Next up is George Hermock, followed by Alan McWayne. So I have a recording here from my 
buddy, my friend George, and uh, excuse me, just for a moment. Excuse me, Diane. Uh, yes. Your time's up. Could you yeah. Yeah, please um, get the next um, person? This is for George. Um, I would encourage him to send that message in directly to us, please, and I'll call Alan McWain to the podium. Thank okay. you. He's 101 years old oh, and great. He cannot come in person. If you would just share, if you could just share the video, the uh, audio recording with us, that would be great. That's yeah, what email. I have. In the email? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so next up is Alan McWain, who will be followed by Rachel Bittekofer. Uh, good morning, uh, Commissioners, uh, Chairperson Laurie Trieger, and Mr. Moro Heisky, Mokor Heisky. Um, I also want to say the M's, I think they can say, be saved in a location other than the fairgrounds. I've got two ideas. Maybe I can meet with uh, Joel Cole and Alan Benavides, and we can summarize those. But uh, it seems like a lot of people are here to support the M's. I support them also, but not at this location. Now, last year, master plan was put on hold in April. All design work was put on hold uh, in August. And since uh, middle of December, the city has been waiting for financials. They can't pr uh, proceed with their proposed ballot measure without those. Uh, last week <clears throat> was really eventful. You know, right in this room, um, we saw the uh, staff recommending a reset on all planning. It seemed like there was agreement from the uh, commissioners on that. Also, um, LEC manager Corey Buller said he supported that. Two days later, Lane County Fair Bo uh, Board, for obvious reasons, said they opposed it. And um, also last week, there was a presentation by Travel Lane County, and we know that they have long uh, opposed that. Last week, um, Council President Keating made this statement. Uh, he thinks that um, he expects the bond measure to proceed based on the buy-in from the county partners. Well, let me count the uh, county partners or the players, the BCC staff, the consultant master plan, LAC, the fair board, and travel lane. All six of those are either opposed or want a reset to the, uh, the planning process, especially uh, the fair board and uh, Travel Lane County and the consultant soundly reject the stadium. Thank so you. So I'll send my rest of uh, my comments by email. Thank you for Thank your you. public comment. Next up is Rachel Bittekofer, followed by Justin Freeman. Hi, I'm Rachel Bittekofer. I come from West Eugene, um, the otherwise known as the forgotten stepchild of Eugene. And that's what I want to speak about today. I was really shocked when I got home after 12 years living in exile on the East Coast and found out that the M's might have to leave town because the city and the county and the state hadn't yet found a way to hold this valuable, actually, I would argue, irreplaceable community asset that adds so much richness to our uh, experience in Eugene. And I have to say, I was kind of like tale of two cities when I got home. I looked over at the university area, and if I lived in that university area, I'd be pretty pleased at the progress of the city, but it's actually the progress of the university, right? And the rest of the city needs a festivist for the rest of this. We can't get a indoor sports arena uh, for kids over on the west side because the frogs and the turtles that we created will be in danger, right? So this is an opportunity to put something on a really dead area of the city. West Side, there's some people here from West Side that are supportive of this, or um, the community fairgrounds neighborhood who are supportive of this. And what they know is what I know and what you guys all know. It's not going to decrease their property value to put this community asset there. In fact, it's going to increase it a lot, okay? No one's neighborhood gets worse with some kind of infrastructure like this coming in. And what we saw in Bend with the old mill district is the exact model that I envision for the future of Eugene. I am future focused on this city. I hope that you guys are too. I know it's a really hard position. For us, it's easy. We don't face voters. You guys do. And I appreciate your leadership on this because this project would have already been dead if you hadn't stepped up and asked the rest of the state and the city to show some support. So I'm hoping that we can get this across the finish line today and we can move forward into a Eugene that's bright, that's revitalized, that isn't just crisis spending all the time. Thank you for your public comment. Next up is Justin Freeman and he will be followed by Tim Lowey. 
Good morning. Uh, my name is Justin Freeman. I own Bagel Sphere, a uh, bakery and coffee shop with two locations here in Eugene and also Oregon Co-Packing over in East Springfield. And I'd like to speak uh, in favor of the new facility at the fairgrounds. You know, we have this kind of common refrain in Western Oregon that we have four seasons of rain, 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 and company. Uh, but the summer is actually a really challenging time for restaurants here in the metro area when we lose thousands of U of O and Bushnell students who go home for the summer. And those months are really hard for our industry. Um, we welcome any efforts that bring crowds to our county. And in fact, we do see direct increases in business when we do have big events here in the county. You know, and I understand that part of the intent of the facility is to utilize it as a concert venue. Well, good concerts drive overnight travel, and adding an excellent outdoor concert venue will serve as an anchoring event to bring more people to our county to enjoy long weekends here. If you go online right now to the Cuthbert Amphitheater's website, you'll see 30 hotels, motels, and campgrounds listed there. Uh, Cuthbert concert attendees are directed to lodging and camping venues in Eugene, Springfield, Coburg, Dorena, Veneta, Junction City, and Triangle Lake. People travel for concerts. The website for Edge, uh, Edgefield provides links to hotels in their area, and so does the website for the Hayden Homes Amphitheater in Bend. And if you look at Hayden Homes Amphitheater as a model, Bend isn't the only beneficiary from increased concert tourism there. The show might be in Bend for one night, but visitors shop in Sisters, eat dinner in Tumalo, go to a brewery in Redmond, play golf in Powell Butte, float the river in Sun River, and rent a hotel room for multiple nights in any of those communities. For us, a single concert might draw you to spend the weekend here versus Portland, but once you're here, there's a lot to see. We have so much to offer here in the county. I you know, often joke that with Willamette Pass all the way to Florence, our slogan ought to be from ski to shining sea, because um, we've really got it all here. Uh, I'll trademark that. No. <laughs> uh, you know, and when people come to visit, they see that we have a lot to offer. Give them a reason to come watch a national recording act at the fairgrounds, and they'll stay and see all the great stuff we have to offer. Thanks, y'all. Thank you for your public comment. Next up is Tim Lowey, followed by Larry Abel. Hi, my name is Tim Lowey, and I want to begin with something I've had to do far too often in my career, and that is issue a public apology. Uh, I just harangued one of the commissioners, and that wasn't fair. Um, part of the reason I don't see collective office anymore, besides the fact I'm too old, is because I don't actually have the temperament for it. Having said that, I'm sorry, Pat. Pat and I first met... Um, 25 years ago? 27. 27 years ago when he wanted to be appointed and applied to be appointed to the council. And at that time, I was the swing vote. And Mr. Lowy, I'm sorry, we're hearing that you're we're not picking up. There. For somebody that gets uh, intemperate at time, I'm pretty soft-spoken. So about the emeralds, I'm not here in favor or opposition of the emeralds. I am a strong supporter of the emeralds. For a variety of reasons, the fairgrounds has been an underutilized facility for many, many years. It needs to be revitalized. What I'm here is in process of, and Mr. Bakke probably knows this is anywhere else, when you're 90% done with the project, you're halfway there. Now you're more than halfway there. Uh, you've got commitments from the state of Oregon, from the city of Eugene, and from other members and other organizations in the community that are important. Uh, I dread to think what will happen with the state and the city's relationship with Eugene if after they've committed tens of millions of dollars to this project, it doesn't go forward at the last minute. Um, there's a lot of people speaking for and against this tonight today, but there's nothing on the agenda saying I'm an action item. And if you take an action on this, okay, my last 13 seconds, you can address the concerns of the neighbors and others. I spent a career in, de in design, build, construction. You can value engineer. You can reduce costs. You can change the footprint. You can change the plan. You have time for that. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next up is Larry Abel, and followed by Rick Wetzel. Good morning, commissioners. I recognize some of you. Um, I've attended and enjoyed a M's games for about the last 50 years. I started to take my son with me <clears throat> when he was about three years old. He's now 47. When he was about nine, he chased foul balls. When he was about 13, he chased girls. When he was about 17, he was no longer interested in coming to games. 
When he was about 20, he and I again went to games and enjoyed a day at the ballpark. <clears throat> After Civic Stadium burned and the Ducks moved to PK Park, I was one of the people who wrote a letter to the editor in which I, <clears throat> excuse me, criticized the new ballpark in many ways. I got a call from Alan Benavides, the new M's general manager. One of the first things that he said was that he didn't choose to move there, which he didn't. Um, one of the first things that I said that it was very noisy. He then said I was probably under a speaker and that he could move my seat. I said I wouldn't want that because I was close to the beer. <laughs> he, he said you could have said that. We continued to have a nice conversation. At some point, he asked if I wanted 2,000 free seats for my Section 8 clients. I was the exec executive director of uh, AXA at the time, Housing and Community Services of Lane County. Of course, I said yes. Alan also arranged for Sluggo, the M's mascot, to come to the annual picnic that we held for children who lived in our housing. As most of you probably know, the M's under Allen's leadership have contributed many hours to the welfare of our community. It would be a great shame to lose the M's as a significant asset to this community. I think it is important for other families to enjoy the M's as I have. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next up is Rick Wetzel followed by John Stokes. Thank you for the time. Um, public speaking is not my forte. <laughs> uh, it takes a lot to get me uh, to come um, say anything in public like this. Uh, I'm here for support for the uh, Eugene Emeralds. Um, I wouldn't want to be sitting where you guys all are to make a decision. I. I know it's got to be a complex issue. I know you, the the 4-H and the, um, um, the agriculture. It seems like you you should be able to have both the baseball and the agriculture. Um, I don't know the best place to put it, Paragons or somewhere else. I I, I don't know, but um, my grandparents uh, grew up in uh, New York City, and the Brooklyn Dodgers left, and it left a hole in their life, and that's. Not quite like the Brooklyn Dodgers if they leave Eugene, but um, for like me and my brother who don't miss a game almost, um, and the community that people we we meet, um, just I hate to lose that cultural um, connection to a um, something that's happened since 1955. Um, thank you for the time. Thank you for your public comment. Next up is John Stokes, and that is the final person we have signed up in Harris Hall. Then we'll switch to our online forum. And after that, if there's anyone who arrived late and didn't get a chance to sign up but wishes to speak, I'll call on you at that time. <coughs> Please state your name for the record, and the timer will begin. Hi, uh, my name is John Stokes. Uh, I grew up here in Eugene and have been living here for uh, 35 of my 37 years of life. Uh, so to say the least, I'm a bit of a townie. Uh, I understand this is... Clearly, a, a hot button issue. This multi-use stadium, and when I look at it, I look at, at the opportunity of it. Um, obviously, we have the M's that fulfill the the majority of the need for the stadium and the operations of it. However, I look at the opportunities for different concerts to come in. There was a concert that was held last summer in the in the time of a weekend after a baseball game that held about 9,000 people at PK Park, and then the following morning there was a motocross event, and two days later they were doing a baseball game. I mean, if you can't see the writing on the wall there for the opportunity of different events and avenues to come through that stadium and through that multi-use stadium, you know, we're really losing an opportunity if we don't find a way to get this thing done. I look at the support for local businesses and entities that the M's provide through that stadium. You go through, whether it be the beer cart, the ice cream, whatever it may be, it's somebody here locally that's providing a lot of that of those values between Nkasi, Prince Pucklers, whoever it may be. Um, and at the end of the day, again, uh, I fully respect everyone's uh, desires to use tax money for um, a variety of purposes, but at the end of the day, I I'm just tired of losing. I mean, we just lost a hospital for crying out loud in Eugene. I'm tired of losing. I want to see this thing come through uh, and really be able to 
utilize those fairground properties uh, for something, you know, looking forward to the future. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Tanya, I'll turn it over to you to uh, manage the online queue. Last I heard, I understand we have four people signed up online. Is that still true? That is true. Thank you. So if you would like to give public comment at the Board of County Commissioners meeting for March 12th, please raise your virtual hand. And then when I call your name, I will unmute you and you will be given two minutes timer for your public comment. The first person I see is Lisa Warns. Lisa, would you like to be on camera? Show you are self muted. There we go. Can you hear me? I can. Would you like to be on camera? Certainly. Okay. You're going oh. to see a um, opportunity. Should I join as a panelist? Yep. Yes. Hello. And it is happening. You can unmute your camera. I don't see where to do that. Uh, I, it's okay if you want to just go ahead and give public comment. Okay. Um, well, I um, uh, listening to all the comments. I I also I don't disagree with keeping the M's here. Um, I don't agree with spending tax dollars right now, and twenty five dollars doesn't sound like much, but. My property taxes have been going up by 100 here, 200 there. Every little bit is starting to chip away at my ability to survive on my fixed income. You know, I'm moving into retirement. I don't even see how I'm going to afford to stay here, you know, when I'm full retirement. So anyway, I, I can't support it with tax dollars right now, not when we have services we need, mental health. Uh, drug addiction, homelessness. I realize homelessness is a, a national problem, but that we need to turn turn our heads more to what we need to do as good human stewards and help our community, help the residents of Eugene, help them survive. And sure, bringing I'm, I'm all for bringing a revenues into town, and and um, I support businesses, but. I don't think that the uh, the placement of the of the uh, ball field is the right placement either. So that's my two cents. I just think that we need to focus on spending our tax dollars on unnecessary programs. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your public comment. And I do see. Recording in progress. Would you Hello? Like, Hello, Christine. Would you like to be on camera? Yes, that's fine. Okay. And I do show your camera is um, not shown. This, you have it muted. Hey, I see so. it. I'm sorry. I see it. Great. All right, you can begin your public comment. Okay, there it is. Um, I'd like to reply in response to comments that have been in the news uh, in the last weeks since the last commissioner's meeting. Uh, AMS general manager, Alan Benavides, suggested that to avoid destruction of the livestock arena, the stadium be moved to the east. But at the June 27th Lane County Commissioner work session, the project planners, construction company, and architects presented the stadium design and budget saying, we realized it would have an impact to the livestock building footprint. We investigated a variety of options to see if we could eliminate that conflict, and it's just not possible. So yes, with the destruction of the arena, the project cost is $100,469,000, not $90 million, which keeps uh, being said. And so let's talk about a local project that was recently completed in Eugene and designed by the same architecture company. It's a 75,000 square foot building that serves the whole public with 60,000 visits per month. It's built to seismic zone four standards and if needed becomes an emergency use shelter with kitchens, bathrooms and enough indoor space to house five to 600 people during a natural disaster. And the cost under $50 million. 
Instead of considering a vibrant year-round use facility, the proposal here is to use 100 million plus in public funds to build an open air stadium that will sit empty for long periods of time and that will only house people displaced by natural disaster outside in tents, no matter what the weather or the time of the year. Local government should not divert local taxes designed to generate tourism and taxpayers should never be asked to consider a bond measure to subsidize an out-of-state for-profit corporation, especially when there are so many pressing community needs and existing budget cuts. You have an opportunity and a responsibility to use public funds for the benefit of the whole community. I urge you to take the most fiscally responsible, forward-thinking, community-minded path and vote no on building a stadium at the Lane Events Center. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your public comment. I see David. Recording in progress. Can you hear me okay? I can. All right, I can't. Um... You should see an option to promote to panelist. If you go ahead and accept that. Okay, let me turn on the camera. Yep. Camera on. Yep, go ahead and begin your public comment. Hello, my name is David Beatty. I'm a longtime resident of, of Lane County in Eugene, and I am here to support the Eugene Emeralds and um, having a stadium at the fairgrounds. I think the fairgrounds is an appropriate venue. I think um, it, most baseball stadiums and minor league stadiums around America are in similar sort of settings. And um, the M's have been a great part of the fabric of Eugene. And they, they contribute back to the community. They, they support the, the community through a lot of different initiatives. It's been discussed by, um, you know, other panelists that have spoken earlier in, in today's um, te public testimony. I feel, I, I feel that the state is obviously on board with it. The state has um, donated significant funds. I feel the majority of Lane County residents are in support of the, the stadium. I also think that, you know, the, the M's have been treated unfairly in this community in a lot of regards. They were, you know, they were pushed out of um, Civic Stadium through deferred maintenance and allowing that facility to go into a state of decay only to be, you know, where the U of O stepped up and allowed them to come in and be a part of the, the their facilities for as long as they can. Obviously. There's significant conflict and demands from Major League Baseball requiring the, the current requirements um, allow them to um, are, are forcing their hand and in our hand as a community to help the M's as much as they've helped us in our community. I think um, it, it's well money spent, and I think that um, we should move forward with it. I think a lot of the opposition is is a NIMBY issue where people just don't want to have that that stadium in their backyard. And, and the fact of the matter is, is every single person that lives in close proximity to the fairgrounds knew what they were buying into when they bought their houses at that point in time. That fairgrounds has been there a lot longer than the residents that have lived in proximity to it. And for folks, you know, that are looking to um, reallocate the funding to um, an indoor track, I think it's an unfair statement as this has been a long, hard fought, ongoing process for the community to help them succeed. Nobody's in the opposition of an indoor track. We just don't think the timing for that is right right now with this as on, on, the, on the table. And, and thank, I, thank you for your public comment. I see. Anyone else? Please raise your virtual hand if you would like to give public comment. And I do not see any others raised, so I will return the meeting back to you, Chair. Thank you, Tanya. Is there anyone that arrived late in public uh, in Harris Hall who would like to give public comment? I see Bonnie Glass and Dana Trail and someone else. So I'll call. And is that you, Wendy? Wendy, thank you. I'll call Bonnie Glass to the podium, followed by Dana Terrell, followed by Wendy Crowfoot. You will have two minutes. Timer on the wall. We'll start when you state your name for the record. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Bonnie Glass. I'm the owner of Euphoria Chocolate Company, and I want to thank you and everybody who's here today sharing their perspective. Um, I've written to each of you in the past, so it's no surprise to hear that I'm here to offer my support um, and express my support for the stadium and the Eugene Emeralds. 
And there's been so many wonderful things said, but I do want to touch on something that hasn't been discussed as much, which is really the valuable community asset that is the Eugene Emeralds and the incredible amount of work. Excuse me just a minute. I'm hearing that we don't have sound um, for our um, meeting organizer. Tanya, are you not hearing, are you hearing my microphone and just not the podium? Okay, it just, it just returned. We're good. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. So, uh, would you like to have us reset the timer, or you want to pick up where you left off? I can pick up where I left okay, off. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Sorry about that. No problem. But the work that the Eugene Emeralds do here in the community would be something that would be really, truly irreplaceable and in some ways catastrophic to many organizations that rely on them and what they bring to the table. I know that they go to schools. They help lots of organizations in a variety of different ways beyond just simply offering free tickets. And so I really want to encourage you to think about this also from the perspective of not just what we lose in terms of an event that you can attend, but the many community organizations that will be negatively impacted and what that loss will look like for the community. Thank you so much. Thank you for your public comment. Next up is Dana Terrell, followed by Wendy Crowfoot. Good morning. I'm Dana Terrell, and I represent Taxpayers for Transparency. I'm the chair of the board for Traveling County, and I have a small business in downtown Eugene. I want to agree with the M supporters here today that the M's have been placed in a very difficult situation, and it is unfortunate. And it is uh, Major League Baseball that has put them in this place. And it's, it feels to me like you are being put in a position that is probably familiar to you of emotion versus economics. And that's a really difficult place to be. You've got lots of people on both sides. And I don't envy your position. To me, emotion is not what wins the day. And we have some economic reasons why it doesn't make sense to build the M Stadium on the fairgrounds at this time. To me, the questions are, are the fairgrounds the right place for this M Stadium? I think the fair board has said they don't think so, and I think you have started a master plan that can determine what exactly is the best use of that space. Is, is the travel, uh, the TLT lodging tax, the best use of that, the mechanism that you've chosen to consider for, for funding, is that the best use? to fund an M stadium? I think we know it is not. We know that minor league baseball stadiums do not generate a lot of tourism, and they specifically don't generate it in the winter months when the industry needs it the most. And you have asked for an op operating plan and a revenue projection and a return on investment that I don't believe has been presented to you. So from an economic standpoint, I do not believe you have the information that you need to make an educated decision. So I don't think your position has changed from six months ago. And I'd like to support what Commissioner Farr put forward last time you met about this, and that is to vote on it today and to decide not to use TLT funds to fund a for-profit minor league baseball stadium on our county's fairgrounds. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next up is Wendy Crowfoot, and that will conclude public comment for today. Good morning, Wendy Crowfoot. I live down River Road. Sorry, is that all the questions you guys need answered? For that, for the intro, okay. Uh, hi, this is a partnership since 1955. Lots of memories throughout the whole community. Definitely understand that. But one of the partners is asking to change the agreement. They want more money and more land. And from what I can tell, they're saying a lot of nice things and not giving many details about how we're gonna be taken care of as we change this agreement. Um, so what is the return on investment for the TLT, um, both short and long term? Uh, I hear that it's an all season stadium, but it's open air, so it's not gonna be all year. We couldn't have had anyone in it in that last freeze. We would have, so it's not an all year. Uh, how are other cities that have built the stadiums doing? Are they, is MLB and these minor league team being great community partners? Um, both in the short and long term? Are, are they expected to continue to be great partners with them? Or are the cities finding that maybe short-term agreements were made that they're not sure what's going to happen after? Um, we do have some, some, some places to look for information. Um, and I hope that you will. And I hope that we can get questions like this answered before we decide whether we're moving forward. Thank you so much. Thank you for your public comment. 
That concludes our public comment portion of our meeting. As I yes, I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt, yeah. but there was one more. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, there was one more person wanting to please step to the podium, state your name for the record. When you do, you'll see the timer on the clock will start and your two minutes will begin. Thank you. My name is Jerry Samaniego. I have been a member of the community for a little over a decade now, so not, not as long as some of the other folks who have spoken here. Uh, but in that time, I have definitely become a big M's fan. I'm a lifelong baseball fan anyway, um, so I am just here to speak in support of that. To me, this project seems like a no-brainer. We're getting 90 or $100 million investment in infrastructure. That's good paying local construction jobs, um, other jobs to follow, both year-round jobs and seasonal jobs in the stadium, plus all the traffic that's gonna bring to the neighborhood. Good for, the, good for local businesses, good for local restaurants. Seems like a no-brainer. That's all. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Thank you, Commissioner Buck, for that. Oh, and one more. And I will take one last comment, and then we do need to move on with our agenda. Please step to the podium, state your name for the record, and your two minutes will begin. Hello. My name is Nick Squires, longtime Lane County resident. So, uh... I could sit here as a burgeoning academic, as a doctoral candidate at the University of Oregon, we, and I could go over fiscal arguments or the proper use of tax dollars or any number of very black and white and binary issues that people want to argue about in terms of the emeralds. But let's get real here. It's the intrinsic value of the emeralds to this community that mean the most. I highly doubt that any member or any commissioner here got into politics because of numbers on a spreadsheet. They got into politics because of their neighbors, their family members, their community, making a difference. I'm here as a proud member of the recovery community. Some of the best memories I had with my father, PTSD riddled war veteran, were at Emerald's Games. They provide low cost and free tickets to the most vulnerable populations in Lane County. What happens when the emeralds leave, I could sit here and talk about taxpayers for transparency, you know, AKA the hotel lobby, all right? We could talk about proper use of tax dollars, but the real issues here, and the reason why there's so much community support is what the emeralds mean on an individual and personal level. Let's look at the long-term scheme of things here. Property taxes increase. I'd be happy for my property taxes to increase if it means one nine-year-old boy can have a positive memory with his family. These issues are obviously very important to me, and I think they're very important to the overall community. And I don't want the Emeralds to leave based on financial considerations only. There's something here that we are going to miss more than tax dollars. Thank you so much. Thank you for your public comment. <clears throat> that really concludes our public comment portion. Uh, I, for those that came in late, I will point out our agendas are posted online. When there are materials associated with agenda items, those are also available to you by clicking on the view materials link. Um, we have a few items of business on our morning calendar. Um, and for those of you that came to speak on the issue of the stadium, um, we have a quick item before that, then we have a report back on the legislative session, and then we will be taking up in a discussion only an update on where the county is on this project. Um, and I just will preface and say I understand there's a lot of different information and understandings of this project and the moving parts and pieces, but as a county, we are dedicated to our good process, and this uh, report back that we'll be having and discussion later is simply that. It's a report back and discussion on where the project stands from a county perspective, and there'll be lots of overarching information about it given at that time. If you do not wish to stay for the remainder of our meeting, please, uh, we ask just that you exit the hall quietly so we can continue with our business because the meeting is being uh, broadcast and recorded, so I ask for your um, respect and, uh, and patience with us as we ask you to keep your conversations out in the hall. Thank you so much. Uh, with that, we will move on to Commissioner's response, if any, to public comment and or any other issues or remonstrance they wish to raise this morning. Commissioners. Commissioner Buck. Thank you, Chair. 
I want to sincerely appreciate everybody that's come out this morning. Uh, I know it feels like it's getting down to the wire on the M's item. Um, and each, I read each and every one of your emails. I listen to each and every one of you who comes to speak to us intently. Um, I thank you for your input and I will reserve the rest of my comments regarding uh, the stadium when we speak about it a little bit later in the meeting. Thank you. Commissioner Seneca. Yes, so uh, start by just saying wow. Thanks everybody for coming out. You know, it, it really does mean a lot and um, I explained that in my, my email responses that thank you for emailing me and uh, you know, I, I am taking it into consideration. Um, I'll reserve some of my comments for later, but I do just want to say I've never had uh, people on both sides of a topic come up that uh, I agreed with so much. You know, this is this is a big topic, and uh, we, we've got some things we need to iron out. So thank you all for being here. Commissioner Farr. <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Uh, a couple of things real quick. Um, uh, Ms. Louise, Diane Louise, uh, please be sure we get uh, Mr. Hermock's testimony. I I'm looking forward to hearing that. So I double, I'll double down on asking you to send it to us. Thank you. Uh, not much to say. We'll be debating this issue at, uh, for a little while. Um, just wanted to say that uh, <clears throat> I came to, <clears throat> I'm a recent arrival in Lane County also, moved here in 1973 to attend the University of Oregon, where I started watching baseball. I started watching that very fall at Howe Field, U of O men's baseball team. Uh, they had a fairly good team. They had uh, Donnie Reynolds. Anybody remember Donnie Reynolds, home run hitter? I loved watching U of O baseball. You know what they did? They suspended baseball. They took it away. Men's baseball was gone for years and years and years. And it came back really, I think, it's stronger than ever. They have their own stadium. Um, and I go to those games there also. Love baseball. Um, anything else I have to say, I'll say at the end of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Vice Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, again, super job, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, like Commissioner Seneca said, you I've, I've never heard both sides articulate their position so well so far, so good job. There's a couple things that I just want to uh, know that you heard what I said. For one thing, Heidi Ringus, you guys are keep coming to the board with a mountain of evidence, and I'm hoping that someday we can take that mountain of evidence and actually move the needle somewhere, so I'm hoping that that still happens. A couple of statements that I, that I, I want you to know that I heard. Uh, one, Justin Freeman from Ski to Shining Sea. Uh, you and Dana Terrell need to get together and have an ad campaign done. I think that would be really great. Um, I think this project would be dead if we hadn't stepped up. Rachel, you said that about the county. I think the county's done a lot of positive and patient uh, uh, awareness to this campaign about how to make it get to the finish line. Unfortunately, it's not up to the county to get it to the finish line. I'll reserve more comments for that later. Uh, uh, when uh, Someone else said that when you're 90% in the project, you're halfway there as a builder. When you're 90% in the project, you know you have no money left. That's what I'd like to say about that. And then John Stokes, you said that you respect the tax dollars, but I'm tired of losing. And I'm a very competitive person. I can certainly relate to that. I'm sure there are many of us in this hall that love baseball and sports and can relate to that. And I think in large, in general, we've lived in a culture long enough where we've had a lot of losses and we're looking for some victories. And I'm with you to help find that but I can't do that at the cost of more losing. So I wanted to make sure that you knew that. And lastly, Dana, you said emotion is not what wins the day. And that couldn't be the truer statement of today. Anything in real estate that I've learned in development is emotion always loses you money. So you have to look at this objectively. And I understand that the M's have a very dear heart and a large uh, footprint in this community. But at the same time, we need to put our emotions away and make the best decision we can for the community, not based on emotions, but based on what we know. So I thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, I will just also uh, add my appreciation. As I often say, everybody has a choice about what to do with their time, and you all chose to be here and let us know what's on your mind, and we very much appreciate it. And thank you, Commissioner Farr, for elevating the request to send us that voice recording. We very much want to hear it. Um, there's just often at audio challenges and so on, and so I think we will hear it more directly if you send it right to us. So thank you for carrying that forward on behalf of your friend. Appreciate that. Um, and uh, like other commissioners, I will reserve um, any comment on the item until we get to that agenda item. But what I will say is anyone that knows me knows, um, regardless of where I land on an issue, I am a um, 
advocate of rigorous and thorough process and the county's process is unfolding and part of that process will be our agenda item and discussion that we have uh, a little later this morning and many other entities and jurisdictions public and private are also working their way through their process and it's difficult when processes take a long time but um, they take as long as they take so uh, with that I will move us on to item five and look for a motion for today's consent calendar all items listed on our consent calendar are consistent, uh, considered to be routine items by the Board of Commissioners and will be enacted in a single motion as published. Do I have a motion? Yes, Chair. I'd like to move and approve the adoption of the consent calendar for March 12, 2024. I'll second. It has been moved by Vice Chair and seconded by Commissioner Buck to approve today's consent calendar, March 12, 2024, as presented. We'll call for the vote. All those in favor, please signify with an aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. And we will move right along. Thank you for that, commissioners, to item six, county administration. And the first item is a report back on the activities of the legislative short session. And we have with us uh, Alex Kyler, our intergovernmental relations manager. And is Mr. Adams with us online, or is he not with us today? He's on the agenda as well, I'm, why I'm asking, I'm sorry. I Just, don't believe he's. OK, great. Well then, uh, unless our administrator has anything to add on this item, we'll just move right into, and uh, do you need help with the presentation? Oh, there we go, great. Kyler, Lane County's Intergovernmental Relations Manager, and I'm here for just a brief wrap-up of the um, 2024 legislative session that adjourned sine die last uh, Thursday evening after a um, pretty typical whirlwind short session for the Oregon legislature. They, if you've been following the, um, the, the, the public media, you see they've, they actually did quite a bit of work. Um, as well as unfortunately leaving several things on the table. So we, we've got that to deal with. So in your packet, um, I just wanted to refer to, you've got a memo from me um, and a then a, a one page or two page document on our priorities and the outcomes and then a brief PowerPoint um, slideshow that we're gonna go through here today. I did wanna note, in the, in the memo on page two, I did talk a little bit about the financial and resource considerations. It's very typical for the county to go after funding issues or at least to identify important funding streams. The legislature did appropriate a um, significant amount of new money and in their end of session budget reconciliation bill, sometimes we refer to it as a Christmas tree bill, there were a couple of um, important items. One was $900,000 for Lane County directly. This will be, um, uh, these are, this is general fund money that will come to Lane County for purposes of matching a federal um, community project that was actually just reached the President's de President Biden's desk last week. So that uh, is a total of almost $2 million for emergency communications equipment. And um, I think, uh, Chair Trigger, you'll recall we advocated for that in our last United Front trip. And Commissioner Bucket sort of builds upon significant um, resources that the legislature previously appropriated to us as a result of wildfire issues. Um, so an additional $2 million for emergency communications. Um, we also got uh, named for lottery-backed bond revenue for the Lane County multi-use facility in the amount of $7.5 million. That's actually located in, um, it's in uh, House Bill 5201, Section 11. Uh, Section 12 is sort of interesting as well because the city of Hillsborough got um, they actually got $15 million for the Hillsboro Hops project, so the two projects were viewed by the legislature as moving forward sort of apace. Um, both both uh, uh, appropriations or authorizations, more, more accurately, are contingent upon all other funding being secured, 
And I should also let the board know that it's a lottery, like I said, it's a lottery-backed bond. The Department of Administrative Services works with the treasurer's office to issue those bonds. They won't issue that bond uh, or start to, to really prepare the They'll start to prepare the bond sale probably in December of 2024. They'll actually work with bond council to get the bond sold in March of 25. So these are not dollars that are going to come to the county immediately. There is a bit of a, a lag time. And the Department of Administrative Services will work with us to, to sort of examine that um, contingent upon all other funding being secured language. As they, as they prepare for that bond sale. And then finally, the third bullet there in the memo is about $4.2 million that came to Lane County. Um, it actually was in, in, embodied in a bill that Representative Nancy Nathanson uh, had worked for months with a number of local stakeholders on. It was House Bill 4136, and it was a, a bill that was really designed to deal with the closure of the university district's um, emergency uh, department. And so there's about a million of those dollars that we will be the fiscal agent for and we'll transfer over to the city of Eugene. And then we'll have a, um, about $3 million there to work with um, Health and Human Services to design innovation, innovative service, innovative health care projects. And, and so those, uh, those are sort of three high points for us, I think, coming out of the, the legislative session. Um, I will say that uh, the the other big issue that we worked on was uh, Measure 110, and if you move now to the other attachment A, which is our Lane County priorities, um, I'm going to briefly run through this document. We did, um, if you recall, we came, the policy division came to the board. Did you want to be moving through slides during Not this quite presentation? Yet. Okay, thank you. Just making <coughs> sure. Of attachment A here from thank your Thank you. Board Sorry. Packet. But so this was this is a document that I typically design something like this every session for members of the legislature to really outline like here's here's sort of the big items that the county will be working on, and then typically at the end of session I'll sort of do a summary of that document to show where we actually landed with respect to those early session or pre-session priorities, um, and so everything in this document that's italicized is really sort of where we landed with respect to the things we went into the legislature prioritizing. Um, the first bullet, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna go through this whole document, but I do wanna just highlight a couple things. The first bullet was really important. As you know, we've been continuing to work on issues related to immunity for behavioral health services. We were able to get some language into House Bill 4002 that I think is pretty important for statewide operators, and that is that we were able to expand the explicit authority beyond just police to be able to transport to a sobering center or treatment facility uh, for somebody who's really highly inebri inebriated or in behavioral health crisis. We were able to expand that to mobile crisis intervention teams. And notably, we were also able to get immunity for those mobile crisis intervention teams. So that was a really pretty big win for us. I think um, um, for those of you who have been watching this work over the last couple of years, immunity is a very difficult thing to get in the Oregon legislature. And so um, we worked with the co-chair of the Joint Addictions Committee, the joint chairs, and they were immensely helpful in getting that language into the bill. And so it's a nice little piece that Lane County um, can take credit for. Um, also on immunity, uh, recreational immunity was something that was in the news quite a bit due to a case out of the uh, city of Newport. We, um, you know, I put in some testimony, I didn't work that issue all that hard, but the good news is we did get a little bit of enhanced recreational immunity at least for a year. There's a sunset on that measure. Um, and so it'll come back in front of the legislature in 25, but at least there is, um, for all the people, and there were, there were several uh, folks, particularly private landowners, who came up to the legislature from Lane County to talk about their agreements with uh, local parks and how they grant access to their lands. So this was a good piece of news for us. Um, again, uh, spent a little time on this document for House Bill 4002 and Senate Bill 1530, and I will do some a little bit of a deeper dive here in the slides. 
we had sort of a mixed bag. I did want to note on the third bullet down here, I, I don't know how that happened, but I started to a thought that I didn't um, unfortunately complete, the Criminal Justice Commission. I've now um, rectified that and I'll make sure that the, the record reflects that completed thought, but essentially what that's supposed to say is the Oregon Health Authority was appropriated $10 million for uh, community mental health programs and their role in coordinating deflection programs. And then the, the next bullet obviously is, is accurate. It's $20 million to the Criminal Justice Commission also for standing up deflection programs. So a total of $30 million that will come to counties. I'm, we're very clear how the CJC money will come to counties, less clear on how the OHA money will come to counties. But essentially, if you use sort of the rule of thumb that, that we do for most formulaic distributions, about 10% will come to, to um, Lane County for Measure 110 deflection programming. Staff is going to be meeting next week um, for a first internal meeting to discuss sort of how we're going to stand up this work. Um, and I would also note um, that the uh, Willamette Family Treatment Center was successful in a bid for some capital construction money. That there was a big pot, $80 million or so, of funding for capital projects across Oregon. They were successful in our region for that funding, and I understand, uh, Chair Trigger, that you might have some knowledge about that project. So we'll be, we will definitely be reaching out to community partners as we look to implement the, the new law. Um, so uh, I mentioned 4136, the, the work that Nancy Nathanson did. Um, I will also just point to, um, oh, the big, the, big, the big thing that we had really talked about when we came to you prior to session was making sure that we were able to find the uh, a path forward for $16 million of Community Corrections Act dollars. Those actually did show up in the funding bill for House Bill um, 4002, so $16 million to the Department of Corrections to continue community corrections. That's going to really help. It'll, it, won't be per, it won't be a full um, sort of addressing all the need in community corrections for the next biennium, but a pretty good start. And um, we're going to continue to see, I think, progress moving forward on community corrections budget adjustments going into the 25-27 biennium. So that was a nice piece of work. Um, and then there were, there were a number of things that, um, unfortunately, we didn't get. The, Col the Coleman project was something we talked about with the board. Um, there was some good news, though, in terms of uh, for Ollie Court, for the child care facility. There was a, a million dollars, a million and a half dollars appropriated for that. And then, um, interestingly, in, in Senate Bill 1530, which was a, the funding bill for the governor's housing package, uh, there was quite a bit of focus on infrastructure for cities that would result in additional housing. And um, we actually saw a pretty good list of allocations for Lane County City. So $6, $6 million to the city of Eugene for Crow Road improvements for uh, infrastructure, $3 million to um, Springfield for Glenwood, um, primarily water and wastewater. $3 million to the city of Cottage Grove to develop uh, 35 acres for new housing. A $1 million for Cresswell for wastewater connections. And $1.9 million to the city of Florence. So nice little um, tranches of money to our city partners for that. So I think I'll just um, quickly run through this slideshow. 1537 was... 1537 was the uh, governor's housing and stability production package. Um, the, you know, one of the more contentious pieces of that was the UGB expansion. So we outlined here what, how that will work. But essentially, if a city proposes to build um, lower income housing, they can do almost an automatic expansion of their UGB depending on population. So we'll be looking to see how that uh, rolls out with our local cities. Go ahead, next slide, Sarah. 1530 does have the appropriations for that um, for that package, and there's quite a few things that that we're um, interested in there that we'll continue to to monitor. Um, 
And uh, as I said, the, 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 the package locally for the um, cities was a big part of that. Next slide. House Bill 4002, this is a, this is a flow chart that um, the Association of Oregon Counties is uh, um, distributing. Uh, Commissioner Farr, you'll recognize this from our meeting yesterday. They're also holding another meeting, I believe, next Monday to talk more in depth about implementation. But I think for us, the important thing to look at is the new, House Bill 4002 creates that new white box that you can get an arrest or a citation for possession of a controlled substance. But if you go up to the blue, that's really where the county um, public safety and community mental health programs will work together to create deflection programs. There were 23 uh, counties that expressed a commitment to building those kinds of deflection programs. We were one of them, and that sort of gets us in the queue for some of this early money. So we'll be really focusing on trying to make sure that those deflection programs are in place. And, and I will say the legislature is going to be watching closely to make sure that um, how that how that work is going. So no pressure. But uh, they, their, their eyes will be on us for that. Uh, next slide. So um, Measure 110 also had its own funding bill. It was House Bill 5204. Um, kind of an interesting mix of stuff, like the, there was $3 million for the Nurse Family Partnership Program. We weren't quite sure necessarily how that related to, to uh, Measure 110, but that's where the funding ended up. Same with the $16 million for the uh, uh, Community Corrections Act. But the, the point being is there's, there are some different kinds of um, buckets of money in there that I think will also be important for us to think about how we could um, leverage uh, some additional money for specialty courts in particular. Um, and uh, uh, the other one is the uh, $10 million for jail-based medications um, treatment. That's a grant program. And so that's one that uh, I think we'll be really interested in watching to see how that, that rolls out. Uh, next slide, go ahead. So there's the 16 million for yeah for community corrections. Uh, oh, there was also an, an additional seven and a half million for community restoration. That's a big piece of work that we do locally. Again, weren't quite sure how that necessarily ties into Measure 110, but um, that's going to help uh, definitely for some of the workload that we're experiencing under community restorations. Go ahead, next slide. This is uh, Representative Nathanson's bill. Um, you can see the 1.3 million will go to the city of Eugene, and we'll continue to will continue to manage the implementation of the 3.2 million for the healthcare innovation fund. And then finally, a um, couple other bills that we were we were watching, um, and as you recall. Uh, Chair Trigger, we we mentioned two of these in uh, the letter that you did in support of. Um, uh, House Bill 4002. Unfortunately, um, and the media covered this just yesterday, but House Bill 4023, which was super citing, I'd actually assumed it passed until yesterday um, when I learned that as it went, it had gotten amended in the Senate and went back to the House for concurrence, and the House never took it up. So we lost the super citing, which we felt was really pretty important for Measure 110 implementation. and. Um, that's probably going to slow us down a little bit, too, because um, if we do get any sort of pushback from citing, particularly residential treatment facilities, um, it, it, the super citing authority would have really rectified that. Um, so I'm, I'm frankly not all that sure what happened in the House with that, but the big change was that the Senate added the residential lands into it, and when it moved back over, um, the House had no interest in taking it up. So that was an unfortunate um, uh, piece of news that I just learned about yesterday. The good news is 4092 did pass. That one is definitely enrolled on its way to the governor for her signature. That's a bill that community mental health programs have been working on for a number of years. And um, importantly, it should result in a shift from just an appropriation for work, particularly around community restoration, to actually adding that into caseload prediction work that the Oregon Health Authority will do. And, and it should give us a little bit more of a uh, sort of a formulaic funding where 
it will be based on um, caseload projections moving forward rather than just a discrete uh, appropriation, which is one of the reasons why we have to always go back in a short session to grab more money for community restoration. So that's a, that's a really nice piece to have gotten across the finish line. And then I did just add in campaign finance reform because it has hit the media here over the last couple of days as a, as a big priority and importantly I think um, there was a nice shout out to Representative Julie Fahey for some of the work she did late in center to make sure that that got across the finish line. And I think, is that our last mm -hmm. slide? So I'm going to wrap it up here. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, I think, uh, you know, we did see, I will just note, we did see some, um, a very big announcement late in, se in session from Representative Paul Holvey, who's decided to retire um, from the Oregon legislature. And uh, so some changes coming ahead for the Oregon, for the Lane County delegation. But I will say that, um, between the work that Representative Nathanson did on the University District and Representative Charlie Conrad carried a bill that was just required an intense amount of work, House Bill um, 4056, which was a foreclosure related bill. Um, and uh, we did manage to get that bill across the finish line. It wasn't really quite what we had wanted going in, but we'll make the, the best of what we've got there. And I'm sure that foreclosure will be an issue that will be addressed in the 25 session. So anyway, ha happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. To the board, questions for Mr. Kyler. Commissioner Farr. Thanks. Um, Mr. Kyler, Alex, thanks for the report. Very thorough report and a lot more detail. People watching online can click to uh, items. Um, there's a great deal more detail. <laughs> but what I wanted to mention is that you uh, carried your work into the into the legislature this year, much as you were directed policy-wise by the board, you, you achieved a lot more than uh, even the most ambitious amongst us expected you to achieve. But we've come to expect that, Alex. And I'm going to take just one moment to say this. Um, as a former state representative, um, and as having worked with you here for the last 10 plus years, I don't know of any more effective lobbyist in the entire building than Alex Kyler. <laughs> Alex has been tremendously, he, he opens doors where doors are close uh, shut. He finds ways to make things move that uh, weren't going to move, and he gains um, uh, partnership and, and uh, colleagues in the in the House that sometimes you would not expect those people to be holding hands. Alex, bravo on this session. Thanks very much. Thank you. Commissioner Buck. Thank you, Chair. I, too, echo Commissioner Farr's uh, sentiments for all your good work. Thank you very much. Um, I also want to give a shout out to our local legislative delegation who fought very hard for several of these wins that you just noticed. Um, we know that we had a lot more things that we wanted to get done this session, um, but five weeks is really hard um, to get all our ambitious items over the cross line there and know that that will be in our work for the upcoming 2025 session. I am extremely excited to hear about the $900,000 for the additional um, communications. Um, I know we started out with $5 million right after uh, the Holiday Farm Fire in order to rebuild communications, add additional capacity. This will extend the capacity of those communications throughout the county in case of emergency management needs. Um, we continue to uh, build that system out. There's more to be done there in order to create the safest, most responsive system um, in case of disasters that might occur in our region. Um, and I'm happy to continue uh, that fight at the legislative level. The thing is, it's being heard and it's being funded. People understand that um, at the state level, how important those communications are across the entire state. Um, and in a crisis, that is absolutely essential. Without communication, nothing can be done. Um, so I congratulate you and your help with that as well, uh, and thank the legislature. Thank you. Commissioner Seneca. Yes, uh, thanks, Mr. Kyler. I'll, uh say a couple of those things it's 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 always a good time walking through the uh, state capitol with alex because it's like your celebrity yeah, kyler, kyler. <laughs> everybody wants to talk to him um 
Thanks a lot. I have a question about the uh, lottery back bonds for the uh, for the M's. I think I don't want to put you on the spot here, but um, you said they'll start selling those bonds when funding is uh, all the funding has been identified. How close to that number? Like, what number do you go with? Because we've got a couple of different numbers, um, and how close to that number do you think we need to get to before they'll start selling their, those bonds? Uh, Chair Trigger, Commissioner Senega, that's a that's a very good question, um, and I I think maybe I'll answer that. Like, I just, if you recall, in twenty three, we were able to get. $5 million in lottery backed bond authorization for the um, crisis stabilization center. So literally, I mean, we just um, finalized that work with DAS to prepare that measure for bond sale. Um, they, you know, as, as staff has presented to that uh, project, we're not really all the way where we want to be with the funding you know the capital the capital stack for that project but das was able to get to yes with us because we were able to show some documentation that we had sufficient funding to get going on the project um, and build at least part of it um, and I think we referred back to a it was sometime in 2023 when the capital projects manager was here and talking to you about sort of various iterations of that project and how much those iterations might cost. And so we were able to sh share that documentation with DAS compared to what we actually expected to have um, in, in funding and they felt comfortable moving forward with the bond sale. So it does appear to me to be s somewhat of a dynamic um, a dynamic conversation, but DAS will definitely want to see something very likely that has come in front of this board to talk about, well, here's where all the various pots of money are and here's how much this thing will cost. Um, so I think that's, you know, again, a, a kind of a dynamic conversation back and forth with DAS to see when they become comfortable with that. Our stabilization center did not have that kind of language. And I, so I think DAS will probably be, and they, they've got the same language in the Hillsborough money. So I think DAS will probably have a pretty, they will, they will want to make sure that that legislative intent is met, that indeed there is, they want to be the last dollars in so that all the other funding is secured, save for the seven and a half million dollar tranche. That's, yeah, that's, that's good. How I answer. Thank you. Vice Chair. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I just want to jump on the train. There's nobody like Alex Kyler. We're going to get T-shirts made and hoodies and just kind of like promote you all through the hallways here. You did a great job. I think uh, what's more exciting, uh, exciting for me is the funding for the housing package infrastructure. I think my personal experience as a developer is that we're facing really serious infrastructure problems to our economic development and expansion and what we can do. So that's really great news for, and everybody gets a chunk of that, which is uh, really fine work. And uh, again, there's nobody like you, man. Good job. Thank you. Well, I will uh, I'll expand on the appreciation of your work in the building and say that part of what makes uh, you effective in the building is you're also effective supporting and preparing us to sometimes join you or send emails of our own or uh, provide testimony and then just brief us as things are, are coming up so we can... Um, in our position advocate for what the county needs um, and what serves our constituents. So I, I not only deeply appreciate your work uh, in the Capitol building and the well-earned respect you have there, but your work here internally to the organization and supporting us as a board um, in moving that work. And as Commissioner Buck mentioned, a five-week session, they got a lot done for such a short term. And, and as folks may not know, legislators are limited as to how many bills they can introduce. So. Um, we, our delegation uh, really did stellar work. I have, uh, I, I understand we're going to hear more about 110 reform and how the deflection programs are going to get stood up. That is unfolding. Uh, it is disappointing that super siting piece. I don't know if you anticipate that'll be a standalone and that will make it harder or easier because it'll be a more focused item in the long session. And that's one question. Do you have any, what's your crystal ball say about that? I think it will be an item in the long session. Um, where it might land, I mean, um, 
you know, super siting came out of a bill that was a placeholder bill. Um, so it sort of arose later in session. And yeah, I mean, the, the legislature is really hard to predict how they will, will do that. Um, it, the, the, the good news is that, that, it, that it looked like there was quite a bit of support for the measure there at the end by stakeholders. So again, I'm not quite sure what happened in the House. Um, you know, it, the late, late, late session stuff is always dicey. People are tired. They want to get out of the building. And it might have just been that sort of thing. Like, we are just, we're not taking up new measures. We're done. Yeah. So I, I don't know what the... I can find out, and I plan on finding out because I'm sort of curious myself. I will say, Chair Trigger, that um, you know the the um, priorities and, and principles document continues to be really functional. There were a number of pieces of testimony that I put in that you know described that document, that referenced the board's support for these things, and um, so I think it really does. It is continue to be very functional. As Commissioner Buck mentioned, you know we've got a keen interest in emergency management and emergency preparedness. There was a really what I thought was a really good measure that um, Representative Paul Paul Evans it was actually a package of a constitutional amendment plus um, an implementation bill. I thought it was really great. We we testified in support of it. There are thousands of pieces of testimony in opposition to it, and and ours was like one of the only supporters. But you know, it he he continues to work on this notion of emergency preparedness, and he late in session I was watching the floor, and he did a remonstrance about it. So I think he's he continues to be a champion. Obviously, people are not crazy about paying additional taxes in the state of Oregon, but he's at least exploring ideas for how to help the state be better prepared and not so, you know, sort of in response mode and actually trying to avoid whether it, mo mostly wildfire, but um, other issues, as, other natural disasters as well. So I think it's an issue that will continue to evolve. But again, I just wanted to, to lift up that, that that document continues to really work, I think, pretty well. Um, there were a few things where we did find that um, and we do this every session where it's like, ah, this, this document didn't, doesn't quite hit that adequately. And so we'll bring that back. And again, it continually tweaks it uh, with board approval. And, and I think it, it works really pretty well. Great. Thank you. Yeah, that issue of superseding, I know we've talked about it, um, not as it relates to the, the legislative session this year, but um, similarly for child care facilities, right, that there's a clearly identified and agreed upon crisis around um, an inadequate um, number of spaces and then we find them and zoning issues get in the way. So hopefully that whole issue, whether it's for treatment, child care, other and housing, um, can be taken up by uh, legislators. I have two other hopefully really quick questions. Um, one, and maybe you don't know the answer to this, but the additional dollars for medicated assisted treatment in correctional facilities and in, in county jails specifically. Do you have any sense from the conversations whether the appetite is to deepen and expand on existing proven programs so that they can do more better or to help counties that don't have a program put one in place? Uh, Chair Trigger, I, I think that they will, I don't think they're going to ignore existing programs. Um, I think you know we've got a program where grant funding runs out in July, so the timing should be pretty good for us in terms of putting something together. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't think so. I th I, where I thought you were going to go was that um, what the grant program doesn't address is um, facilities in, for youth. Mm -hmm. So there is another part of the bill that does create a task force to look at youth addiction issues. Um, and so th that's good, but it isn't quite as immediate as, and there is a need out there in communities for youth uh, services. Um, and I actually saw, I think it was in today's Oregonian, an article about another bill that got left on the, left undone that, uh, or uh, Representative Dexter talks about that was for youth services as well. So we, I think the state has got some work to do with respect to ensuring that youth or uh, youth issues are addressed. Yeah, great, thank you. And then my last question is the caseload projections. 
I, I know in other, like with our um, folks on supervision, there's a problem with how it's a look back to historical information about caseloads and then an allocation based on past caseloads and not real time. Is there anything in this that ensures we don't fall into that same kind of trap? I don't think so. Okay, thank you. Trigger. I think that, yeah, that, that, is, that is sort of the, the problem. I think they, you know, to the extent that they can build a database of caseloads and, and sort of extend that projection out, it will help. But yeah, you're right that there were things that I think were very unpredictable with respect to community restoration in particular. And um, that caseload continues to drive up in spite of things that, that folks are trying to do to, to bend the curve. Um, I think community restoration is an issue that the board will want to continue to look at and there's um, there's actually been a very recent report by the Oregon Health Authority that came out December or January that I could distribute to you if you like but it's a really pretty deep dive into community restoration and some of the issues there and it's it's uh, I think it makes a worthy read great thank you again very much for the report and answering all of our questions and just generally for your as usual, stellar work and county administrator. I, I just want to um, make a comment that, you know, the, the title lobbyist has, um, carries with it sort of a negative connotation these days. And you think about a back slapping uh, person who uh, is, is meeting with legislators and trying to steer an issue. And Alex is effective in the building, as you all know, not because he's a back slapper, he's actually not at all, <laughs> but rather because he has really good information um, and he has the trust and credibility of legislators. Legislators actually rely on lobbyists to give them good information with which they can help make informed decisions. And um, so I've been in the, in the building with Alex, as all of you have, and it is like you're walking around with this celebrity, but they gravitate to Alex because they know they can get really good quality factual information that will help them. Um, and he's, he's done that because he's built the trust and credibility. I want to just point out two things that a little bit glossed over the $16 million CCA, which we're only getting about 1.5 million of, roughly, and then the $3 million in uh, for Nurse Family Partnership. Had the, those were like, in the totality of all the money approved, smaller dollar amounts, hugely impactful to our budget for next year. If, if not for those restorations, we would be faced with either further exacerbating the general fund problem that we already have next year, which is pushing $7 million short, or we'd be looking at cuts to really critical programs. So just a couple of examples of really important um, fixes in addition to everything else, but I just want to share in the chorus of thanks for the great work Alex always does. Thank you, and thanks for calling out the Nurse Family Partnership. My guess is the argument for putting that in the Measure 110 reform is there's nothing much more primary in primary prevention than making sure pregnant women and, and infants are healthy and start out on a good foot. So that would be my guess is why that went in there. So yeah, thank you so much. Great. All right, moving down the agenda, we are on item 6B and I will uh, welcome to the table our operations director, Lauren Blythe to join county administrator. I think county administrator is gonna um, tee us up for this item and then Lauren has a presentation for us and this is a discussion only item in the matter of reporting on the status of a proposed Lane Event Center multi-use community facility and I will turn it over to our administrator to introduce the item. Thank you. Thank you chair and commissioners. Uh, we're pleased to be back in front of you today. If you recall and in your packet uh, you have a memo that has a really lengthy timeline that goes back all the way to, golly, December 14th, 2021, when we began uh, this process. That's three and a half, is that three and a half, two and a half years on that we've been working on, uh, on this with uh, Eugene Emeralds, with our staff at Lane Event Center, um, and various partners. In August, August 29th of 2023, six, a little over six months ago, was the last report that we had to the board and we talked, we provided a, a staff report, included funding um, and a project status update. And we offered to the board that the project really was on hold pending these big questions about uh, state funding, which you heard a little bit of information about, a contribution from city partners and the city of Eugene has had some conversations about uh, potential funding moving forward, um, as well as some private sector 
um, fundraising that needed to happen. So we're back before you today as six months has elapsed and we want to provide an update on the project, knowing there are still a lot of questions that are out there. I want to um, recognize that you heard from several speakers this morning that noted um, f folks who spoke both in favor uh, and in opposition to um, the, the proposed project at the proposed site, but all noted that we are here because Major League Baseball has put the M's in this situation. I just want to recognize that Lane County, State of Oregon, City Partners, uh, the Emeralds, and our community, I think, are all united in our desire to try to find a solution here to this challenge. But we're in the in the situation largely because uh, MLB has forced these requirements on um, facilities uh, for minor league, and so we're trying to do what we can to advance. Uh, this work, as you noted, Chair, we're not seeking a decision today from the board, but certainly we'll take your guidance and feedback and direction uh, moving forward. So I'll turn it over to Lauren to provide you with uh, the update, and then we're available for questions. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Chair, Commissioners, good morning. Lauren Blythe, uh, Director of Operations, here today for a report back on the proposed multi-use community facility uh, at the Lane Event Center to and, and to answer any questions you may have. First, a a uh, brief uh, history of the project. Um, as has been mentioned, in 2020, Major League Baseball introduced new facility requirements. Uh, the M's play their home games at University of Oregon's PK Park, and that facility does not meet those requirements. Uh, around that time, the M's are also promoted to high A uh, minor league baseball, which uh, approximately doubled the number of home games to about 66, conflicting with the university uh, baseball uh, season. Um, the M's looked uh, in 21 uh, and into 20 or in 2020 and 21. The M's looked at over a dozen locations in the Eugene Springfield area, uh, and in 21 uh, approached Lane County uh, to consider the Lane Event Center as a potential site for constructing a new ballpark. Um, the location was uh, selected in part due to community benefit, available open space near downtown, uh, and lower cost to the team. Uh, in December 21, a prior board directed staff to study the feasibility of constructing a ballpark at the Lane Events Center. Uh, through 2022, staff conducted preliminary site analysis and uh, some due diligence efforts that included some ground, toil, ground soil testing, utility mapping, land use planning analysis, uh, and uh, some uh, community outreach. No issues were found with the um, with the early or preliminary uh, uh, land use uh, preparation work. Uh, the community outreach efforts included um, dissemination of informational postcards to the surrounding neighborhoods uh, around the Lane Event Center. We also stood up a dedicated website uh, with FAQs, um, a phone number, and an email address for folks to submit questions to and get answers. Um, funding efforts around that time included uh, state legislative appropriation in the 2022 session uh, for $7.5 million, as well as a transient lodging tax and car rental tax increase that was uh, from a prior board as potential funding sources. In March of 23, well, in late 2022, uh, we procured a design build and architectural team uh, to look into what it would take to, uh, what the uh, design considerations might be. Um, and in March of 23, a conceptual design was delivered with an initial cost and uh, cost estimation that conclu uh, which included facility scope and an early uh, project budget. The design at that time for the ballpark was for a 4,200 person game capacity and approximately 6,000 uh, person capacity for concerts. Interior spaces of the facility were designed to meet immediate occupancy standards, standards to act as a potential resource for emergency operations staff. Um, in August of 2023, which was our last update to the board a little over six months ago, um, that update included a project estimate of $100.5 million um, from the design build team. 90.5 of that was for construction efforts. Uh, 90.5 of that was for uh, a construction estimate, and the remaining $10 million was for rebuilding the livestock stadium or the livestock arena. Uh, we learned at that time that all orientations of the ballpark, uh, the, with any orientation of the ballpark, the footprint of the facility would overlap the livestock building, causing it to need to be rebuilt. Um, also, we learned at that time that the contribution of Lane County's land, where the 
where the facility is proposed is valued at approximately $9.5 million. At that time, in August of 23, staff reported a funding gap of approximately $43 million. This was based on an assumed 1.5% of the two percentage point increase of transient lodging tax and car rental tax. Um, also, the design and architecture team advised of potential cost escalation since the uh, estimate was delivered in March of 23. Uh, prior to the update in, 20, in August, uh, the M's had reached out to the city of Eugene to consider a potential funding contribution towards capital construction of the project. And at that time in August, Lane County placed the project on hold, pending for, uh, further, uh, um, further per, uh, pending additional funding from the M's and other sources. Current status, current status of the project. Uh, as I mentioned, the cost is estimated at 100.5 million, 90.5 for construction, 10 million for the livestock building. And this estimate is still based on the conceptual design from March of 23. The and cost escalation again due to the aging design was estimated by our design build team and architecture team at approximately up to $300,000 a month from September 23 and beyond due to the age of that estimate. Uh, reliability of the estimate is unknown due to the amount of time that has been uh, that has passed since the estimate was initially provided. Current funding summary. So, in 2022, there were two appropriations. One was at the federal level for 1.5 million dollars uh, towards um, uh, immediate occupancy. Uh, an additional or an initial 7.5 million dollars was. Uh, was appropriated in the 2022 legislative session, and that money is also secured. In additional, as Alex Kyler mentioned in his legislative update, an additional 7.5 million uh, was approved in the recent 2024 legislative session, is waiting to be signed by the governor, and is contingent upon other all other financing sources being secured. Going back a little bit in September 2022, a prior Lane County board approved a two percentage point increase to both transient, transient lodging tax as well as car rental tax. That increase became effective January 1 of 2023 uh, and revenue from that uh, increase has not been allocated to this project or other, uh, any other uh, project. Um, at that time, our legal staff reviewed the statute around TLT, and it was determined that the proposed facility would be an allowed use of that revenue uh, should the commissioners choose to do so. Uh, staff had previously pre uh, presented projections of 1.5 of the two percentage point increase from TLT and CRT uh, as an upfront equivalent of approximately $35 million. This was done only as a point of reference, and again, no uh, revenue from those increases has been, uh, cons has been considered by the board or approved. Um, in 2023, middle of 23, the M's requested a capital contribution from the city of Eugene. The city of Eugene has referred a $15 million bond measure to the May election. City council has sought input from the board or from the county on a commitment to construction, uh, capital construction, a plan to fill the funding gap, as well as an operational plan that does not rely on the city for resources. Um, we staff had already had also reported as of last year, uh, $13.5 million had been committed by the Emeralds um, as uh, upfront capital contribution, as well as $3.5 million towards uh, furniture, fixtures, and equipment. Since then, the Emeralds have, have proposed an additional $10 million based on uh, potential revenue uh, sharing negotiations with the county. From an operational perspective, an operation, operating agreement uh, Operating agreement work had been paused in August of 23. Terms and conditions around what those uh, uh, around the operating agreement have not been determined or finalized. Um, in addition to impacting the livestock building, uh, the ballpark location of the ballpark would affect other uh, operations at the Lane Event Center, including the County Fair, Oregon Logging Conference, and other activities. Impacts of those have not yet been mitigated. Um, early property tax estimations are projected to be up to $1.5 million per year for the proposed facility, and the responsibility of those property taxes would be that of the tenant. In summary, in summary, um, regarding project costs and funding, again, we're looking at $100.5 million for the total overall project costs. 
Those estimates are aging and would need to be revisited for if a more up-to-date estimate is desired. Um, the funding gap remains difficult to estimate, not only because of the age of the uh, construction co of the construction estimate, um, but it's also pending outcome of the Eugene bond measure in May, uh, it coming up in May, as well as any commitment of uh, TLT or, or CRT by this board. Um, work on the operating agreement uh, needs to be determined. It needs to be concluded to determine revenue sharing, operations and maintenance responsibilities, as well as mitigation of impacts to Lane Event Center. And with that, I'll return it back to the board. Thank you, Administrator. Anything you want to add before the conversation at the board? No. Okay. Then I will turn it over to my colleagues and just um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Blythe, for the presentation, and a reminder that it was board uh, you know, staff's recommendation to pause the project. Board agreed um, to that with the caveat that we wanted a status report back. We wanted to allow time for the legislative session to conclude and uh, give the EMS time to work with the city and any other uh, potential private funding sources. So that is where we are. Thank you for the overview and update, and I will turn it over to my colleagues for conversation at this time or questions of staff. Vice Chair. We'll jump into the lion's den just so we can get this conversation rolling. I'm wondering, too, Chair, do we want to do a couple of rounds or do we want to just empty off on one and go? What's your time? Um, well, I think, I mean, we have um, we have time for, we, we allotted half an hour as needed for the discussion. And again, I think pending the discussion and our administrators usually all too willing to make it iterative with us because if it's a matter of direction to staff to bring more information back, um, to allow us to continue the county's portion of the process of this multifaceted, multi-jurisdictional uh, project, then um, anything you want to raise that's useful there. So um, I think if you wanted to start with, with an item or two, um, particularly if there's clarifying questions about what was presented, that would be a great place to start. Okay, um, great, thank you. Lauren, super job again. It's a difficult task bringing that information to us, especially in a room filled with this kind of weight on the back of your shoulders, so I appreciate you doing that, sir. Thank you. Uh, you said that the, the, in one of your statements, you said the site was selected because of lower cost to the team. They looked at a dozen other sites, you said, around Lane County, Eugene Springfield. I know the Booth Kelly site was looked at. There's all kinds of problems with that. Um, but they selected the site because it was of lower cost to the team. So right out of the get-go, I want to make sure that the public knows that the M's came to us us because it was a better deal partnering with us because developers we look at things and we say okay if we have an idea as developers we need to figure out a way to partner what we need figure out the financing figure if we can build it and then figure if we can get to the finish line and so uh, I want to make sure that the public knows that uh, the M's are the ones that, that need to get this to the finish line and the county is a partner in this but we're not the decider of this um, you said that the M's came in with 10 million more dollars uh, and that was from quote unquote revenue sharing options. Is that what I assume to be parking revenue, naming rights? Is that something that they're thinking that that's uh, on them to share with the county or is that the county to share with the M's? I'm wondering about that relationship. Chair, commissioners, uh, it's a good, thank you for the question. The specifics of the revenue sharing around that have not been discussed again because of the, the um, operational agreement and in terms and agreements with the M's have been on pause. Okay, thank you for that. So, that, so let's just kind of part. As we're thinking about this discussion, let's compartmentalize on what has been still hanging for six months that we still haven't talked about. There's a, a, a many things that we haven't talked about yet that I still have many questions about, and I think that's kind of the part of the problem for me is here we are six months later down the road, and many, many of the same questions that I had and my fellow commissioners had have still been unanswered. We don't have a way to the finish line. We don't have. Uh, positive partners about how they're going to get there and it just keeps having this emotional pressure toward the county to come up with the with the added money I almost feel like a parent where I'm trying to bail my kid out for his tuition in his college because he won't go get a job so that's kind of how I'm feeling right now as, as the commissioner I also heard you say that the property tax estimates were a million point uh, 1.5 million on the tenant we haven't even talked about that yet have we about the property tax responsibilities on this project correct mm. And then you also, I'm gonna have one more, then I'm gonna move on, I'll come back. You also said that the aging estimate is around $2 million or more, because as the, the design build team said, it was about $300,000 a month times six, that's about 1.8 million. Another month, we're gonna be over $2, $2 million in excess costs, just in talking points, is that correct? That's accurate. 
All right, so I want the public to know that as we delay a positive decision on what the county is going to do, I feel like the county's come forth big time. I feel donating or putting 10 acres of property in a prime area of downtown, it, I think is I think you're undervaluing it at $9.5 million, frankly. I think it's like 12.5 uh, in, in, in my books. But And then also having the burden of the talking point lately of the Livestock Center being then put back on the county. I mean, we're looking at well over a $20 million investment, which I think is, is, is a big, big part of the cookie to bring to the project. So I want to make sure that, that the public knows that the county stepped up. You've done a great job helping us navigate through that. And uh, some of the uh, expectations in costs and financing that the public has put upon the county is not really the county's decision yet. Um, I'm just going to say, frankly, I'm not a fan of 1.5% TLT tax at this project. So that's just my opinion going forward. So I would like to reserve another more comments for some other folks and have a round two. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Vice Chair. And again, any other uh, comments from the board, questions for staff about the status of the project? Commissioner Farr. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Blythe, the, you answered these questions already, but I'm going to re-highlight them. Um, so the uh, the land we estimated, say again, nine point five million dollars. Correct. Which may be underestimated. I don't know. I don't have the expertise to determine that. Um, and then the re uh, the de demolition and relocation of the livestock facility is another nine point five million, approximately. Ten. So yes. um, so about twenty million dollars of Lane County investment between those two, right there. That's not talking about uh, twenty years of um, indebted bondedness, but, uh, indebted bonding for uh, um, a TRT and, uh, and, uh, and um, car, <coughs> car rental uh, taxes. Okay. Um, the, uh, the state has dedicated $7.5 million, but I think I heard you say this correctly. They want to be the last dollars in. That is to say, they won't spend that unless every other dollar is identified and secured ahead of time. And we're not 100% positive if 90.5 million is the correct number because that, that estimate's about a year, about a year old. Is that, uh, did I get correct. that correctly? <clears throat> I think things have gone up in the year. Um, the uh, the other question that I have, and this is for you, Ms. Mulcrisey, our general fund shortage this year was how much again? Um, we're estimating uh, approximately $7 million what? in balance. About in general $7 fund million. Dollars. Okay. And the state has dedicated lottery-backed bonds for uh, our crisis stabilization center in about five, for about five million dollars. See, I'm juggling all of these numbers right here. This, so the state is committing money, but it's the last money in. Uh, we are committing um, about twenty million dollars just on land and building <coughs> reallocation, and that's before we start actually swinging a hammer. Okay. The other question that I have is regarding. Um, the Hillsborough Hops. Everybody's saying, hey, the Hops are building a stadium. And they are. Um, and uh, do, are you, I'm guessing you're not really prepared to answer too many questions about how the Hops are funding their stadium. Uh, I am, Chair, Commissioners, I'm somewhat familiar with what's been in the media around it, but I have not been following it as closely as this project. And we know that in this latest round, they got double what Lane County got for, um, for their stadium, 15 million in this latest round. Correct. And, uh, and, and I'm wondering about the county's commitment for the hops. I know a little bit about that because I talked to one of their county commissioners, uh, count, uh, Commissioner Faye, Faye yesterday, and, uh, and she was pretty adamant that uh, it was a good project, um, largely backed by private money. Um, and the county, she was shocked to say that the county was putting about $8 million in on that. Hmm. And we're putting, well, anyway, there's a big difference there between what Lane County is being asked to put in and what Washington County is being asked to put in for the hops. And Chair, Chair and Commissioner Farr, just to clarify, the city of Hillsboro is the primary public agency that's a partner on, on that project, not yeah. Washington County. And here we're, the, our city is asking if the taxpayers will back another property uh, tax for, uh, for their portion of it. Okay. So there are a lot of big differences there. And I think that, um, you know, I have a few more questions as we go forward, but I'm balancing all of these a million here, a million there, 20 million here, 20 million there, uh, last dollars in. Um, you know, we've been painted into a corner. I will make this statement. We've been painted into a corner, Lane County has. Um, when the M's did look at uh, up to a dozen other sites throughout the county, they picked ours because, and I was a part of some of the discussion on this early, 
because it was a better deal for the for them, for the owners of the M's, for the team itself. It was would cost them less. It's like when you go to use your American Express card, some places they oh, we don't take American Express. The other cards are a better deal for us. You know, so picking and choosing. Um, based upon what is the best deal for my bottom line is uh, what people do quite often, and that's how we ended up with the uh, with the um, Lane County Fairgrounds, the event center property, has been their final decision. I love it; great place for a stadium. But there are a lot of other things that that are going into this, and at this point in time, I'm not real pleased with the way things balance out. I'm not very pleased at all with the way things balance out. I may have more chair. Mr. Seneca. Yes, thank you. Um, or I've kind of, I've got a, a question just to get back to the basics here a little bit. Um, we're here for discussion. What does it take? Where are we at on on just getting some hard numbers and an actual plan? You know, where's the stadium going to go? What happens to the the livestock auction? What happens to the Oregon Logging Conference? Because these are all questions that haven't really been answered. Um, you know, the logging conferences came out and said, we can't do it if that stadium is anywhere where it looks like it'll go. Um, you know, and that's a big deal. And, and we're at this point, and the fair board comes out and says they're not a fan of it. You know, so I'm kind of like, how did we get to this point, and now now we're here? Does that, does that question make sense? Uh, there's a few questions in there, but I'll yeah. do my best, Chair. Commissioner. General of <laughs> So, um, you know, since the project was put on hold in August, or I should say prior to that, um, our task, our charge was to assess the feasibility of constructing a facil this facility. It wasn't to build it, it was assess the feasibility. Um, so in that process, uh, we did some limited community engagement. We did some uh, outreach. Uh, I myself met with the fair board, but just once. Um, and so I think, in, in a roundabout way, the, this process that has gotten the attention it's gotten and, and uh, we've received input from other stakeholder groups such as the logging conference, um, community members, in a way is the process by which we've fleshed out that input, those, the, the thoughts, the opinions, the additional considerations that we need to keep in mind. Should we move forward? Should this board direct staff to move us forward? Um, and so, um, you know, you had we, actually the easiest question you had in there was uh, the, about the location, and so and it did come up earlier. So right now, the proposed siting of this facility is in the uh, northwest corner of the campus, um, and so we in the early discussions around the design and the siting, there were some considerations made, some discussions around what about having it more centrally located, a little east of that spot. Uh, but that, um, if I recall, uh, in working with Corey. Buller, the fair, uh, fairgrounds manager, and other folks, that would, ha that would have been the most impactful to some of the other events and activities at uh, the Lane Event Center. So we settled on the location in the northwest corner. OK. Well, it kind of seems to me, if we get back to a statement that was made earlier, you know, emotions versus economics, we need to really sit down and uh, sort, these, sort these questions out, very legitimate questions. Um, been reached out to by a bunch of groups that are uh, kind of left in the dark whether they can continue to use the Lane Event Center if if the stadium exists. So, thank you, yes. Commissioner Buck. Thank you, Chair. You know, this subject has my stomach in knots. Um, each side of this particular subject has had really good sound arguments for and against um, but we are missing a lot of key information still um, the timing of our discussion today is poignant specifically because we have been receiving a large amount of correspondence um, requesting that today we vote one way or the other um, because we the city of Eugene is on the cusp I believe they have another day or so to potentially pull um, the potential vote uh, for the May ballot on the on the M Stadium 
and I find that particularly disturbing um, because it puts an immense amount of pressure on our board to decide one way or the other without all the information that we would want to see. Um, also, the request is really an attempt to subvert the potential vote and will of the voters of the city of Eugene. And for me, that is a bad look. It would be a different situation if we were talking about the subject without the potential of having a vote to the people in front of us. But the request for us to deny the will of the voters of the citizens of Eugene to vote on the M's is not acceptable. That is a very challenging place for the Board of Commissioners to sit on this subject. I, for one, am not interested in taking away that potential vote for the public. I want to see what the public has to say, their input as they vote, before I'm willing to say yes or no on this particular board one way or the other. That is really important to me. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Buck. Um, I will just say before seeing if there's other questions for staff, um, comments my colleagues want to make. As Commissioner Buck, there's sort of um, one of the greatest values of today's item is to get uh, clear expression of the county's, the status of the project from a county perspective out on the table and get some information out there because the general public, um, you know, it's, a, it's an if question, it's a where question, it's a who's funding question, and those are all our questions still as well, and we're not prepared to answer them or take action because they are still questions. And now there is this additional question about um, a, public, a public voice on the project overall that will help inform any ultimate decisions that we make. And we have multiple opportunities and decisions to be made eventually regarding if, where, what source of funding. Um, so holding those options open for us is part of our process. And as I said earlier, I know it's hard for the community because it's, it's a long process and, and, um, and it's hard to wait. But um, I, think it's, uh, I think it's important to make sure we, we work, work our way through um, the process. Um, so with that, if there are any other questions or comments from my colleagues, I will entertain those now. Uh, Commissioner Farr. Thank you. In, in the second round, I'm, I'm just going to continue my uh, earlier discussion ever so slightly. Um, and I want to reiterate, the county is dedicating um, about $20 million, not for the stadium itself, $20 million of real value to Lane County residents in relocating the livestock building and giving the land in perpetuity to a stadium. Is that, that's, I'm reading that correctly. That's $20 million before the $90, 90 million. Uh, Chair, Commissioner Fari, that's correct. And so the $90 million is in addition to the $20 million that the county has asked to put up front, completely up front. City of Eugene, on the other hand, has a $15 million question that they're asking. That's a pretty easy way out as far as I'm concerned, asking a question for $15 million, which is smaller than we're giving up front, and that's not including indebted bondedness, bonded indebtedness, excuse me. And that's not including uh, some of the other things that go into, a, in, into the building of a stadium on public land. So I think, um, you know, to compare a $15 million um, property tax bond uh, levy from the, from the city of Eugene to the uh, $20 million that we're putting up front, cash, I mean, right out of our, the pocket of the taxpayers who live right here, $20 million before. It's not a question. It's an absolute we're doing it. And the city of Eugene is asking a question. To me, I think we owe everybody precipitation of the event right now. I think we owe everybody to, uh, the, the say, to say, are we willing to give $20 million beyond the $90.5 million that the stadium is going to cost? Um, are we willing to do that? Are we willing to give your money beyond the uh, indebtedness that we go into for our share, which is far more than $15 million of $90.5 90 million. So I'm really, I mean, I'm strongly um, questioning whether or not the taxpayers of Lane County, whether we, the Lane County residents, want to give that $20 million before anything else happens, before we ask, before the city of Eugene asks a $15 million question. 
So I, I think we owe it to people to precipitate the event today. Vice Chair. Thank you, Chair. I've, uh, I'm going to kind of give you a little scenario here, so you're going to bear with me for a few minutes. Most of the emails I've gotten, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, have been about people just don't understand commercial real estate. So I want to tell you what commercial real estate looks like because I'm a commercial real estate guy. So here's the thing. When commercial real estate happens, a person owns an asset. That could be land. It could be a building. And that building or value asset has certain locational value to it or any other intrinsic value. A person comes and wants to rent that. So that makes the commercial owner of the asset, a renter of space. They don't have anything else to rent. If they have a building that's an asset that's already built, the tenant can come in, remodel it to their fixation. Maybe it's a restaurant or a retail space. But the tenant comes in with their improvement dollars to make the asset I already own as a commercial space renter an asset to them. What's being asked of us here in Lane County in this particular situation is for us to give up our asset a, a piece of land is to accept money, what, what the M's are calling prepaid rent as asset, when it's not really asset, it's prepaid rent. It locks in an amount of what we can rent that space for for 20 years. And you know as well as I do, inflation is not going to back down on those next 20 years. Things are going to cost more 20 years from now. We're going to live in a very different world than 20 years from now. So me as a real estate commercial developer, I would never accept this term to start with. This deal coming forward way back years before I became a commissioner would be a deal breaker and a deal stopper for me. So that's how we got here. We got here in a lot of expectations, a lot of emotions, a lot of assumptions on whether or not the TLT money is going to be allotted. And none of those decisions have been made because you have to understand Lane County as a, an available space renter of asset will not make money on this deal. This is not a money-making venture. Now, emotions could feed this ad nauseum for the next 20 years. Your emotions continue to cost you money in this deal. Let me give you an example. 42 years ago, the city of Eugene built the Holt Center. For 42 years, that building has never made a profit. You paid for it. Okay? Every one of your dollars, tax dollars, or if you want to slice it up, you've paid for all those great events and concerts and ballets and all of that stuff to come into the Holt Center. You've paid for that. So at some point, don't you think the government should act like a business and actually make some money for its taxpayers rather than keep uh, absconding money from you every year? My 93-year-old grandmother-in-law may not be living in her house either if we keep taking money from her. She's on a fixed income as well. So finally, the Holt Center gets a clue that maybe they want to be a presenter. They're thinking, hey, 51% of our business we should take on to our own self so that we can make a profit. They figure in the first year they're going to profit hundreds of thousands of dollars that they've never profited in 42 years. Why doesn't the county do that? The M's are expecting the county to come in as an asset and allow them to have space at a fixed rate on a fixed period of time. They're, they're, uh, they're saying that we're going to take an asset of our land, commit it to one use, a stadium, baseball stadium, whatever you want to call it, for a fixed period of time. Lane County won't make money on this. Let me just give you a couple of math things just so you have this, okay? This is how you have to review this. If you were buying a car, let's say you're buying a $10 million car, okay? $10 million, all right? That's prepaid rent for 20 years. That means the M's are going to be paying us about $41,600 a month, $41,600 a month in rent for 20 years. In 20 years, they'll pay that every month. So this money really can't be used for debt service because they're asking us to use that as capital investment to build the stadium in the first place. As a commercial real estate person, if I had a piece of land and somebody wanted to come in and build a gas station on my piece of land, and I didn't really want a gas station on it, but I thought I could make money out of it, I would have them build the gas station with a buy-in of a certain amount that would make it valuable for me to buy in the rest of it, and then I would charge them over the period of time money that I would get back from my buy-in. So at the end of the, the lease agreement, I wouldn't have any money into this, but I would have a higher investment on my asset. That's how commercial real estate works. So they're asking us to come in and, and accept $41,600 a year. But if we have to take out a $30 million bond, and I underestimated this for the TLT, underestimated a $30 million bond. If we have to take that out for 30 years with your money to pay that back, that's going to cost us $180,000 a month. That's 6% interest, if you could get a 6% interest rate. So you've now looked at you're taking in $42,000 a month in rent, but it's costing you $180,000 a month to service the debt. Not to mention what Commissioner Farr said about the $20 million of land and buildings that we've already put forth. Commissioner Buck, did you? 
No. You're just I, getting in the queue now? Just in the queue. Okay, thank you. Sorry. I'd appreciate not being interrupted. Thank you. Just checking to make sure there thank wasn't you. a point of order. Yeah, so, uh, so you're following my numbers, okay? So that means that we're going to be $2.2 .2 million into debt every year. <sighs> I'm sorry, but as a businessman, I don't see this working out. I am here for the county to do the best job it can with its money, and we need to start making money. Mr. Mocher Heisky said we're going to be $7 million upside down. What are we going to take from that? A community of 360,000 people can only do so much. The M's baseball stadium is ranked 95th in attendance out of 120 teams nationwide. 95th. 145,000 fans a year average compared to the highest person, which is over half a million fans a year. That's a lot of investment to put in something that's in 95th place. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner Buck. Thank you, Chair. You know, as a small business owner for about 15 years, I, I understand the logic um, that my colleague is, is trying to lay out. <clears throat> And the fundamental difference is the county, Lane County, <clears throat> excuse me, Lane County is fundamentally not a business. It is a service provider. That is very different. Our model has never been about making money. It is about providing quality, important life care service to our community. The fairgrounds has never really made money. It has been a cultural asset, as is the Holt Center. What we're asking is your input on what kind of cultural and services that you want us to facilitate on your behalf. I don't have an answer to that until I have complete information. That information is, in addition to all the hundreds and hundreds of emails that we've provided, the will of the voters of the citizens of Eugene. That is a very key input in our decision making here. There are a lot of things that I think the citizens of all of Lane County would like to see at the fairgrounds. We won't know that fully until we have a vision. Um, and we talked about that last week, having community input on the vision of the fairgrounds. It often gets the least amount of money because we are, our efforts are so invested in getting all the services uh, to you from all the other divisions that we manage on your behalf. But the fairgrounds in and of itself is a place for people to gather, it's a place for businesses to show off their wares. It is more of how do we want the cultural vibe of our community to resonate? How do we invite people in from the public? How do we invest in tourism in our community? How do we get people to stay here overnight and then go travel around our region? All of those are significant inputs in the decision making that we should be having here at the Board of Commissioners. But underlying all that is a base knowledge that the county is a fundamental service provider. We need to at least break even and not lose money, lose your money, but invest it where you want it to be. And I need to hear more from the people. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm reminded when you say that, and, and it's, a, it's a good reminder, we're a public uh, entity, not a private business, so the model needs to look a little different, but it, but it also does need to look responsible and responsive. And I think a lot about when we worked so hard on the parks levy successfully, um, I really appreciated our parks director talking about, you know, we could charge fees for every single park and every kind of use, and we could increase those fees, but we don't want, um, 
we don't always want to create a barrier in, in the form of a fee to everything we do, that there's a, a public benefit to providing some for services free, low cost, and some for a fee, and what's that right mix? And so what I'm hearing, if there's new um, comments or information the board wants to offer up on this item today, again, this was to give us a status update on the county's uh, perspective and role in this project that is, again, multi-jurisdictional, um, multi-layered, um, was to hear what are the opportunities, what are the questions that remain, and there's a lot of them. And when this project first came to us, one of the cells was um, not to look at it as a vacuum, but to look at it as the potential ancillary benefits or the catalyzing opportunity it could present and the revenue generation, potentially, um, as was mentioned, the revenue share idea. And we just don't have all that information because we have yet to directly ask for it because we haven't been in a place in the arc of the project where it was appropriate to commit that kind of um, staff resource and attention because the team and other partners were out doing their work to see if we could even come close to the capital needed uh, before investing in answering the questions about the operational details. So my assessment is we're, we're not of a mind uh, on this board, but we also don't have all the information we might want about how this would actually work um, to get there. And neither do other jurisdictions as far as hearing from their voters, um, all of whom are also some of our voters. So that's my sort of assessment of where we are. I don't know if there's more information anyone on this board needs today um, from the discussion. And, and my only sort of question for the staff is we, we were on pause. Um, so do we imagine that we just continue pause status until something else um, with these other wheels that are in motion elsewhere resolve? What's, what, it, what is staff um, hoping to get out of this discussion today? And I'm looking to the administrator or our operations director for that. Um, Chair and commissioners, Chair, you're right that um, this was intended as an update, a six-month report back, an update on the status of the project. So we've done that. You've had uh, given us some feedback. Uh, we still do have significant gaps that exist in the project, and we are waiting to see whether or not there will be uh, what the action from the city of Eugene may be, as well as the conversations and questions around private fundraising for the project. So those are two questions, as well as some others that are out there. The really significant issue that the county and the M's need to make progress on before a decision is made to move forward with construction, uh, with financing and construction of the project, is the operating agreement. That is something that we have not completed, and there are some big questions, uh, part of which are the revenue sharing, those things around which the M's have indicated the additional $10 million that's been discussed would potentially come from things like parking revenue and um, uh, advertising or, or naming rights or those types of things. We had always anticipated that that would be part of a negotiation as part of the operating agreement, that that's operating revenue that we would talk about. So those are the types of things that we need to work through. And um, we would anticipate that uh, if there is continued movement by the city um, uh, and this moves forward to the voters, that we would need to make some progress on that operating agreement so that we're prepared to come back to you um, after a May election uh, with a uh, with a draft, sort of a final draft agreement for you to consider in, in addition to um, any other funding financing questions that are still out there. That makes sense. So that that's really, the, I think, the, the county's work uh, over the course of the next few months um, will be focused on the operating agreement. Great. Thank you very much. Commissioner Farr. One uh, significant thing I'm going to ask. Um, what We're not asking the voters for anything. We're telling this is what we're going to do. The city of Eugene's asking for $15 million. We're telling. We're telling $20 million in land and, and building relocation. We know that much. What is our total tell? Is it uh, what, How much is Lane County right now committed? Uh, so how much is on the table for us to potentially commit, including TRT and, and, uh, and uh, car rental, uh, plus the $20 million, which is, the, uh, which is the, the livestock building and the land? So how much, how many millions of dollars are we looking at? Just a quick math. Is it, uh, seems like it's about 55 million, is that right? 
Well, Chair, uh, Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Farr, the latter part of that question around TLT and CRT is, would be dependent upon what the board, should the board allocate, so you know, a yeah. portion of that. But there's a high point on that. What, what is, what is the, the high ask? Is 1.5 is the number that was shown up there. Uh, yeah, 45. $45 million in... to $50 million over a 20-year period of time. In bonded indebtedness. If, if you were to use, yeah, and I mean that's a debt that we right, pay wanna, over the years. Right, why don't we have? Why don't we have our? Uh, <laughs> and I mean, this is just a general number. If it's, if it's, uh, Christine, thank you. Uh, welcome to the. Christine Moody's our budget and financial planning manager. Thank you, Chair, Commissioners. Um, so we would uh, the 35 million that has been mentioned as far as the TLT and CRT is an upfront equivalent. So we would be paying interest on that money over the time frame. So we would have to see what interest rate we get, but it is tens of millions more than that dependent on the interest rate because you would be paying over 20 years. So it is kind of hard to arrive at an exact number for you there, but it is um, more than what is being stated as far as around 45 it would be. The, yeah, then that more. helps me to, thank you, that is, that is brilliant. That helps me to kind of formulate things in a really loose number here. So it's $35 million plus interest, which maybe is tens of millions. Let's say it's only $20 million of interest through the years. That's 55 plus 20 plus $20 million in land and uh, livestock relocation, if we have to uh, bond for relocating the building, there's interest on that also. And then there's the future use of the land that uh, may be used for something else in the future. So just a general number without some of the intangibles, we're looking at maybe $75 million that the city of, that Lane County is putting in, and, and the city of Eugene's asking for 15. You know, we can't make a decision. You all tell us if we want to do it, if you'll do it. Uh, we're, we are saying we'll put 75-ish million dollars into this. Okay, that's all I need for right, right now. Thank you, Commissioner. That's taxpayer money. Yeah, and and to be clear, we haven't, we've said that's what's on the table, but we haven't actually made any of those commitments as yet. Yeah. Yes, just to make that clear. Great, thank you. All right. Uh, so um, it seems to me we've heard uh, from the board. There's still some questions, so. Um, we'll hear back from staff on progress toward an operating agreement, what some of those parameters are, maybe some questions for us about, um, about those items, and uh, just um, a little more information about any additional funding that's been identified, uh, particularly any private dollar funding, um, and maybe some new costing estimates. Terrific. Great. I want to just, so I do, there were some questions that I, uh, I want to be clear, the board did ask some questions related to property taxes, so I think that's something that we need mm -hmm. to, that you've asked for some clarity around. Um, obviously the question out there about whether or not there will be a contribution from the, from the city of Eugene related to a ballot measure, and if that is successful, I think we know where we're at related to the state funding. Um, so it's really the, the property taxes, the operational agreement, and the private uh, funding were uh, and the operational agreement, I would say, are the four, th four areas. Um, did I miss anything? There are those four areas are the areas that you all sort of highlighted as rather significant question marks um, that we will be prepared as much as possible to come back and report to you on when we have uh, information related to those, any of those four. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Blythe. Appreciate your time this morning. And that moves us on to item 6C, which is announcements from county administration. I don't have anything um, in particular today, so if you have questions on any issues. Just a reminder, it feels like a long time ago. You said elections this morning. You said something about when elections is going to come back and begin their countdown reporting to us. I think that... next week. Okay. I think we're having our uh, county clerk, Dina Dawson, will be here. I'm sorry, I'm looking back at Lauren to see. I lost him. He's next week, one. I believe. Okay, that's that's great. That, I was just trying to remember from this morning you made a mention of that. So. Yes. Um, great. Any other, nothing else from County Administrator this morning? No. All right, then moving on, excuse me, to item 7A, order 24-03-12-04 in the matter of approving two contracts and two amendments delegating authority to the county administrator or their designee to sign the approved actions. And it looks like uh, Zach is here with us instead of Director Gray. Welcome. Thank you, Chair, Vice Chair, Commissioners. I will be brief. We have 
two contracts and two amendments. One of the revenue contracts is the yes, county, the county financial assistance agreement uh, for our service elements in our behavioral health unit. We then have long-term rent assistance revenue agreement with the state, two expenses to continue to provide services in our methadone treatment program, and an amendment to a contract with Looking Glass, which is working on our all-in project in our human services division. Thank you. And again, for members of the public, if you want to see the materials we have available to us, you go to our agenda for today and click on the view material at the end of the named item. Uh, do we have any questions from the board on this item? Seeing none, I will ask for a motion on the order. Yes, Chair, I move approval in the matter of two contracts and two amendments and delegating authority to the county administrator or their designee to sign the approved actions per order 24-03-12-04. I'll second. It's been moved by Vice Chair Lovell, seconded by Commissioner Buck, to move approval of Order 24-03-12-04. Any discussion to the motion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor signify with an aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0, approval of Order 24-03-12-04 in the matter of approving two contracts and two amendments and delegating authority to the county administrator or their designee to sign the approved actions. Thank you for that. Uh, we have no need for executive session this morning. And so with that, at the sound of my gavel, we will be recessed until 1.30, at which time we'll be back here in Harris Hall for two public hearings with our Public Works Department. We are adjourned for lunch.